On today's episode, we're going to be reviewing the brand new Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Uh, no spoilers, of course. Dodgeball 2 is now officially coming, the studio has announced. John Wick 4 has become the largest, successful, most outrageously money-making movie in the entire franchise, crossing the $400 million mark and, of course, passing Black Adam. The full Super Mario Brothers movie was leaked on Twitter and stayed up there for hours. We'll talk about why that was able to happen. The question is sent in, is is James Gunn now the best comic book movie director of all time? We'll address that a little bit. Also, Blade, one month away from shooting, has now brought in a brand new writer. <laughs> one month from when they're supposed to start shooting. Harrison Ford says not only is he done as Indiana Jones, but he doesn't think Indiana Jones will ever be on the big screen again. And, of course, back to the Super Mario Brothers movie, it has joined the Billion Dollar Club, becoming only the 11th animated film to do it. What are the 10 movies that are ahead of it? We'll talk about that and a whole bunch more. The John Campus Show starts right now. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet at the John Campion Show. Coming from right here on my YouTube channel, brought to you in part by our friends at Mint Mobile. I'm, of course, your host, John Campion, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, TV and streaming and all sorts of good things, not just giving you our opinions, but giving you information and context so you can have your own better informed opinions, whether they're the same or completely different from ours. Joining me as we are now back from CinemaCon, sitting back there is Ray, <laughs> doing his dermatology thing uh, back there. It's <laughs> Sorry, that's a little uh, off-camera thing we were talking about. Uh, Jen's back there. We got Jonathan running the show, of course. The delightful Chris Carr is also back from Vegas. And most importantly, you guys are here. Thanks so much for being here and making the show part of your day. Here's how today's show is going to go. We break it into two parts. First part of the show, we're going to talk about all those predetermined topics. Then in the second part of the show, we're going to take your questions that you guys can fire in anytime, 24-7, at our tip link at streamelements.com slash johncampia slash tip. Send them on in, and if we deem the comment or question appropriate to be used on our show, you'll see it addressed on this or soon upcoming show as well. Okay, guys, a little bit of housekeeping to get to before we get rolling. Don't forget, if you guys need your daily fix of the John Campia Show, but you can't be in front of a YouTube video, maybe you're on a treadmill, you're commuting to work, whatever, good news, there's an audio-only version simply called the John Campia Show Podcast. Go and subscribe to it today so it'll be there when you need it. Also, I want to remind you guys, I know I failed to mention it all last week, but we were a little busy with CinemaCon, but this coming Sunday is uh, mine, Greg Alba, and Christian Harloff's second big live event where we're going to be getting together, talking about YouTube and all that kind of stuff, but specifically we're going to be talking about Guardians of the Galaxy 3. If you live in the Los Angeles area or anywhere around and you would like to come, there are tickets available to come and be there live and in person. The ticket link is down in the description below. Last time we did this, it was a lot of fun. We hope you can be there. But if you don't live anywhere near the LA area, the good news is that we're going to be doing it as a live streaming pay-per-view event, and there is a link to order the pay-per-view event down in the description as well. So go and check that out. All right, guys, with all that down out of the way, let's get things rolling here. And we're going to start off with this. You know, Marvel hasn't been on the hottest streak lately, at least not with me. Um, you know, I wasn't a fan of Quantumania. I haven't been, uh, I mean, Thor Love and Thunder was a pretty big step down from Thor Ragnarok. Uh, I haven't been really thrilled with a lot of the Disney Plus shows. There have been a couple of them great, but a couple of them I haven't. So... I've been really looking forward to Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3, hopefully grabbing them Marvel bootstraps and pulling them up like an atomic wedgie. Get this thing going. Get the MCU back on the right path again that they have seemingly strayed from recently. So it was with that in mind that I wandered into a movie theater a couple of days ago to watch Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Now, they, uh, they promised that this one was going to be emotional. They promised that this one was going to bring to a conclusion, James Gunn told us like a year ago, that this one was going to bring to a conclusion this particular group of Guardians of the Galaxy. Did it accomplish that? Yes. Yes, it did. This is a really good movie. Um, and and it. I will say this right up front, too. It is an incredibly, I mentioned this uh, on uh, one of the live streams I did this weekend, but it is a very satisfying ending to this particular Guardians of the Galaxy story. 
Like, I, set aside everything else. It's like the way it's concluded and the way it's brought to a close, did I as a viewer of the Guardians franchise, did I as a fan of the Guardians franchise up until this point, did I feel like the way they brought it to a conclusion was a satisfactory conclusion? And I would say most certainly yes. It, it did feel like a really good way to end this thing. And I'm not going to say too much more about it, uh, lest I accidentally let something slip. But it, it was done in a very, very good way. And I love the way the whole thing concluded. The whole movie is filled with the stuff you've come to expect from a Guardians of the Galaxy movie. And even what you've come to expect from a James Gunn movie, which is some incredible humor, but also mixed with really heavy emotional moments, like really heavy emotion. Like it, it's, there are a number of points in this movie that are kind of reminiscent of James Gunn's Suicide Squad movie, where it's like, there's a lot of wackiness, but then all of a sudden they're telling this story about Ratcatcher and her dad, and you find yourself bawling, <laughs> right? And there are definitely those moments in this movie, there will be tears, ladies and gentlemen, there will be tears because the movie theater I was in, there was a lot of gasping and some tears. <laughs> there are some uh, pretty decent surprises along the way. Um, it, it flows well. Now, I, I am not going to call it the best of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. Like to me, the bar that the first one set is just extremely high. Like the first one to me is so ridiculously good. And I'm, I'm not sure I would say that this one is quite as good as number one. It's certainly a big improvement over number two. And it's certainly a very good, solid, entertaining movie. I mean, the audience that I saw it with, they all came out smiling. Um, so, I, I mean, yeah, there's that. Of course, I had a lot of people ask me this weekend, because I also saw The Flash this past week uh, in CinemaCon. And so, obviously, the big question everybody was asking me, well, what was better, Flash or Guardians? They're two very different movies. Um, I would actually say that I think Flash was a slightly better movie, uh, but I, I I really quite thoroughly enjoyed Flash like, a lot. Uh, but these, I was terribly excited coming out of Guardians 3, though, because it's been maybe since 2001 that I've gone to see two comic book movies back to back that I walked out extremely happy with both. Like extremely happy. It's been a while. And with Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse coming out, hopefully that'll be three in a row. Now, let me talk for a second about maybe a couple of the weaknesses of Guardians of the Galaxy 3 without, again, going into any spoilery details. Um, number one is the villain. And when I say weakness, I don't mean the high evolutionary was bad. I, I, I don't mean that at all. But one of the things that have gone along with, actually, not just Guardians of the Galaxy, but a lot of comic book movies is, you know, the most attention is not given to the villains in most comic book movies, right? And rightfully so, for the most part. You want your attention to be on your heroes. That's where you want the majority of your attention to be. Um, and, you know, Marvel has not always had the greatest on-screen villains. I mean, they've had a couple of exceptional ones. Thanos, Killmonger, um, Loki. But, you know, in their 25, 26, 26, I don't know how many movies they've made now. History, quite often what you just want to have is a good, solid villain that can serve as the motivating purpose for the heroes, and that's good enough. And I would say that's what the High Evolutionary is in this movie. The High Evolutionary is a perfectly functional villain character that provides the emotional spark for motivating and driving our heroes. And uh, that's what the character does. He's a pretty cool character, but it's not Killmonger, and it's not Joker, uh, but pretty well done, but again, not a super deep character, but none of the Guardians films have had super deep characters. Even Ronan the Accuser, who I loved, it didn't have a lot to him, really. Uh, so there's that. There is some good background given to High Evolutionary. You understand High Evolutionary's motivations, all that kind of stuff. But again, most of this was focused on our heroes whose story was being brought to a conclusion in this movie, and that's appropriate. I would say the one real weakness of this movie is... One of the elements that I think a lot of people was excited about, and that's Adam Warlock. I think Adam Warlock was one of the weaknesses of this film. Not the oh. performance, not the performance. Okay. But number one, Adam Warlock is really not in this movie very much. Um, and aside from one or two plot things that happened that could have been accomplished with other characters, I would almost argue there wasn't really a big need for Adam Warlock in this movie. Hmm. 
Now, Adam Warlock is like the seventh, eighth, or ninth most important character in the film, to be honest with you. So the fact that this character that is the seventh, eighth, or ninth most important character in the film is not the character you're going to walk out of the theater buzzing about, that's not a big deal. The important thing is that we're buzzing about the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, you know, most important characters, and they had more there. But yeah, I, I'll be honest with you, with how much Adam Warlock was in the trailers, I was expecting more Adam Warlock. I didn't need more Adam Warlock, and I would propose that the movie didn't need more Adam Warlock. But my expectation, I think a lot of fans' expectations were we're going to get more Adam Warlock, and they'd pour, play more of a central figure and maybe be handled a little bit better. But I'd say that was probably one of the weaknesses. But the story of Rocket in this movie, which James Gunn has said, this is kind of a Rocket origin story movie. The story of Rocket will move you. Um, it is heartfelt it is tragic it's it's almost shakespearean I'm, I'm not saying the movie is shakespeare but i'm saying the story of rocket is almost shakespearean the follow-up story of the continuing now stuff with star lord and gomorrah and the status of what their relationship is now and where their wish is handled very well nebula has never been given more to do and been showcased better than she was in this movie groot is great um in this they do some stuff with Drax that I really feel they've been needing to do with Drax, so that's good as well. Um, yeah, overall, I don't think the best Guardians movie yet, but just a little bit behind the first Guardians. It's it's a to me it was a very fun, enjoyable, entertaining, emotional. There were laughs, there were there were tears in my audience. Um, I think it's one that most people are going to enjoy. Because uh, I know I did quite a bit. Maybe not quite as much as the as or the Flash, I should say. But I enjoyed it a lot. So, uh, and now, unfortunately, I was the only one in the room yeah. who, who got to see it. All I got was a text from John saying that I will definitely cry. <laughs> I came out, I said, Chris, look, I'm not going to say why, but you will be crying. There will be Chris You'll tears. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Uh, there will be Chris tears in this. So, I'm yeah. Anyway, you. guys, that is my thoughts on Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, we will, of course, be discussing it once again at our live event next Sunday. We hope you guys can come and join us for that. Uh, and uh, if you guys maybe had a chance to see one of the early fan screenings, what did you think of the movie? Where are your expectations at right now? If you haven't seen it, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this here, shall we? You know, it's no secret that one of my favorite comedies of all time, definitely a top 10, easily in my top 10, up there with films like Anchorman and 40-Year-Old Virgin and I Love You, Man, and, and several other comedies like that, for whatever reason, is Dodgeball. If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. Dodgeball is is one of my favorite comedies with a stupidly great cast because not only did you have Vince Vaughn and you had Ben Stiller, you also had Rip Torn, Christine Taylor, who was, who was married to Ben Stiller at the time. I don't think they're married anymore. I could be wrong about that. Actually, Chris, please fact check me. I don't want to start rumors in case I was wrong about that. Uh, Justin Long, who I adore, Justin Long. Steven Root, Red Stapler guy. Joel David Moore, Alan Tudyk, and Chris Williams. This was actually a terrific cast. Look how young, look how young Justin Long looks in He's that picture. Oh, and and Alan Tudyk is Steve the Pirate. Oh, oh God, I oh I forget that was Alan Tudyk. <laughs> that, that's Alan Tudyk in there. I yeah, crazy love this there. movie. I love it unabashedly and wholeheartedly. Now there've been a lot of talk over the years about the possibility of maybe trying to come back and do another one. Actually, I can't remember which one of the secondary actors in the original a few months ago, we talked about on the show saying, yeah, they really want to get another one, but you know, trying to get Vince to agree to it. Well, guess what? The report is now out. The story is broken that Vince Vaughn is indeed on board and the studio is now developing a dodge ball two. And it is on the way. This comes to us over at CBR and it says, a sequel to Dodgeball, a true underdog story, is officially in the works with Vince Vaughn set to reprise his role from the first film, announced exclusively by Deadline. Vaughn is returning to star and potentially produce a sequel to Dodgeball, the film which is now in early development from 20th Century Studios. And again, uh, the original story that came from Deadline, I'm reading this from CBR. Okay, so how do I feel about a Dodgeball sequel? 
It depends. Look, on the one hand, like I said, I love this original movie. I, ben Stiller in this, nobody makes me bleed my own blood. It's still, I think, one of the great lines in comedy ever. I, <laughs> there's a good energy in the gym. I just, I love this movie so inexplicably much. It's crazy. And so I want it. And you know what? You, you can make the argument with a lot of movies, especially comedies, you don't need a sequel. I get that. But I don't really care what the story of the movie is. I just love these characters and I want to spend two more hours hanging out with them and watching their hijinks. That's all I want to see. <laughs> I'm sorry. Even just the picture makes me laugh. I love this movie so much. Okay. So, John, if you love the movie so much and all you want to see is these characters back and all that kind of stuff, why are you saying it depends? I'm saying it depends because according to this story, there's no confirmation that any of the other cast are coming back. Now, to be clear, so I'm not pushing my own panic button here, <clears throat> it doesn't say none of the other actors are coming back. It doesn't say that. It just says that this, as of this moment, it's not clear if any of them are coming back. And while I believe that actors and performers are like writers, they're like props, they're like YouTube channel hosts, we're replaceable. You can, but there are certain roles in certain movies that are played by certain performers that if you're going to do dodgeball too, I'm sorry, Ben Stiller's got to be there. I mean, I would also very much like to see the rest of the team. I'd like to see Justin Long and I love Alan Tudyk and Steven Root. I would love to see all these guys back. I would love it. But at bare minimum, you can't do... Ben Stiller, I mean, the story is about Vince Vaughn's character, but Ben Stiller is 50% of the equation of this movie that made it so enjoyable and so likable. And just the two of them playing off each other is so great. I got to tell you right now, as much as I love Dodgeball, I don't have any interest in seeing it if Ben Stiller isn't there. Not to downgrade the importance of Vince Vaughn, I also wouldn't have any interest in seeing it if it was just Ben Stiller and not Vince Vaughn. Mm -hmm. It, it, it would be try like trying to do a Zoolander sequel without either Ben Stiller or Owen Wilson, which by the way, they, in case you forgot, they did do a Zoolander sequel and have always regretted it. Uh, Zoolander is another one of the ones that's in my top 10 favorite comedies. And number two is just abysmal. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to just sit here and cross my fingers that they announced that Ben Stiller is getting on bar with this. Anyway, Chris, you hear about this. What do you think about the original Dodgeball? What do you think about the idea of doing a sequel? And can you do it with just one or the other? Or do you think it needs both? I love the original Dodgeball. Thank you, Chuck Norris. I love it so <laughs> oh, much. Oh, that's right. And I think, <laughs> rather than the F you Chuck Norris line, uh, I think this would be really, really great. But I, I agree with you. It depends on having that whole cast there because that's what made this so great. These are weird, ridiculous lines that I think their chemistry and their delivery is really what makes it work. You know? Like O'Houlihan talking about someone being as useful as a poopy flavored lollipop, really, <laughs> it really only works like coming from like a rip torn type, right? A lot of Ben Stiller's lines are from coming from Ben Stiller. And so having Ben Stiller and Vince Vaughn, I think at the very least is a must have for this movie to be successful. I am interested in what kind of story they would do from there, right? Are they still the Globo, you know, Jim Cobras? Are they still playing dodgeball? Are people still following the schmuck? What happened to him? Because he gets all, all tubby in the end too, right? So I, I would love to see what happened to his gym, what happens with Vince Vaughn's character and everything. And uh, Ben Stiller and his wife, they split in 2017, but they got back together in 2022 after oh. quarantining together because of the coronavirus. The world is a happier place yeah. to me now. Mm -hmm. I didn't know they got back together. Yeah. I love that. I love her. Christine Taylor, I was obsessed with on the show Hey Dude. Um, oh, right. oh, it was so great. It was this great, I think, Nickelodeon show where it was just kids who worked on a ranch. Yep. Oh, it was the best. I, I well, I mean, I, she was Marsha, right? She was, yes. Like, she was also Marsha. Sure, Jan. Yeah, in the Brady Bunch. <laughs> and then she was also in Zoolander mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. So there you go. Anyway, guys, question is for you. What do you think about this? Apparently, they are now developing a dodgeball to Vince Vaughn is on board. Are you excited about it? Or are you waiting to find out if Ben Stiller will be involved? Maybe you're not excited about it at all, or you're excited regardless. Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. That down. Let's move on to this here, shall we? You know, one of the most pleasant surprise movies that kind of came out of nowhere and shocked everyone. And it's hard to remember this now because it's been a few years, but it was John Wick. A lot of people forget that Keanu Reeves was a star for a while, disappeared, 
And then the Matrix came out, so he had this big uh, reeves Assance came back, but then he disappeared again. And he was doing a lot of nothing movies nobody cared about. And then he had this, this new little action gun movie coming out called John Wick that nobody really appeared to th think about. And then one month before John Wick came out, they released the first trailer, just one month before the movie came out. And all of a sudden, everybody started talking about John Wick. And it went on to become a modest success. Well, now they've got the fourth movie. And while it opened to a franchise biggest opening, this past week, it has now officially crossed John Wick 3 Parabellum as being the highest grossing. And on top of that, it has now officially crossed the $400 million mark. Yay. And that is significant. Now, listen, I get it. In the world of blockbusters, you may hear $400 million and think, well, that actually isn't all that much. Granted. But this was a small indie spirit kind of movie made on a, by Hollywood standards, modest budgets mm -hmm. and is heavy R rated action. So not the whole family can go. And this has been one of those franchises. We've talked about it a bunch recently that has just had this constant trajectory of success. Take a look at this. So like the first John Wick movie, again, it was, it was just a modest little success. Mate, nobody thought this movie could get near a hundred million dollars. That first one, but it made $86 million. Then the second one, that shows you how good and how well-received the first one was, took a big jump up, more than doubled, to $171 million. And then it almost doubled again in John Wick 3 to $327 million. And as of right now, John Wick Chapter 4 is sitting at $402 million. There's two asterisks there because it's still counting. I mean, it's not going to make a, a shit ton more, but it's going to continue to make some more money. This is a franchise that has just continued to climb. And I think it's because right from the very first John Wick movie, that one that made $86 million, it became apparent that they fully understood what their movie was and who they were targeting it at. This movie is not made, these movies are not made for everybody. Hence, none of them have made $700 million or $800 million or, or come anywhere close to a billion dollar mark. But they understood what the DNA of their movies were and they said, our audience for this is out there. Instead of trying to change the John Wick film to start to maybe bring in a wider range of audiences, they said, you know what? We know who our audience is. And we know it's not the biggest audience in the world, but we believe there's more of them out there. And if we continue to make these movies with our John Wick DNA and we continue to do them well, people will continue coming into the theaters for them. And sure enough, Film after film after film now culminating in John Wick, which has passed the $400 million mark, or as we like to call it around here, the Black Adam mark. It, <laughs> it did what Black Adam was not able to you. do. <laughs> it has done what Black Adam was not able to do, which is make the $400 million mark. And which is, and Jonathan, you can bring that headline up again, which is why, I mean, if you've seen John Wick 4, you know that, oh, well, that's probably it for the franchise. That's probably it. Well, when you got a franchise that every single movie continues to make more and in many cases significantly more than the previous installments, well, all of a sudden what you thought might have been your conclusion to your story may not exactly be your conclusion for the story. As, you know, Hollywood Reporter and other major trades are saying like John Wick 5 is possibly back on the table when, oh. you're, when your fourth installment, think about this, the fourth installment of your movie has literally made more than four times what the first movie did. And depending on who you ask, is the best of the bunch. I personally think John Wick 4 is the best of the John Wick movies, but, you know, that's just me. Anyway, Chris, we're looking at this now. John Wick 4 has hit this really impressive milestone for franchises like this. Every single film outdoing the previous one. What has been the key, do you think, to the success of the John Wick franchise? Like, why is this one that has not only not dropped in quality, but continue to make more money than its predecessors as it goes, when a lot of even very good franchises are never able to do that. What do you attribute that to? I mean, it's a universe that continually builds upon itself. It yes ands everything that it's done, and it makes things so much richer each time you go back in there. I do have to say I haven't seen the fourth one yet. It did get spoiled for me in my Uber to the casino in the airport. <laughs> oh, no. Um, where it was, you know what movie I didn't like recently? And let me tell you why. And immediately gave me that big ol' spoiler. I went, Oh, that happens. <laughs> no, I'm so sorry. Please don't rate me poorly. I didn't. But I think one of the best things about this franchise is that it continues to build on itself. It has such a rich mythology tied into it that makes sense. This underworld makes sense. They have a system in place, a financial system, a tiered system that makes place, uh, makes sense. 
I really, really think Keanu Reeves just crushes it in this role, too. I feel like we all just really love this guy and we love seeing him things, whether he's showing up in an Ali Wong project or he's showing up in John Wick. He's just very likable, even when he's murdering people. And it's all for a dog. We all can relate to this. You can you can have him do anything because that first movie justifies all of his actions from here on out. It's one of those things where you can get behind the wild, ridiculous violence because it's a, okay, well, this is a heightened reality, but two, gosh, fuck those people who killed his dog. That That's was right. Up. right. You know, I think it's just something too where the action sequences are so well executed. I mean, even though some things happen that probably wouldn't in real life, they really, really commit to a sense of realism in them. And again, it commits to the world that it exists in, where you just buy into everything that's happening in a way that some other franchises sometimes struggle, where you see things that defy physics or defy the laws of man and go, that wouldn't happen and I can't suspend my disbelief enough. In this universe, you really, really can. And you just like to see Keanu do well. What a nice boy. I love him. <laughs> oh. By the way, side note, we're talking about the dog being the, I, I'm, I'm a dog person, everybody knows this. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just, a little quick note, won't say any context whatsoever. There's a scene with a dog in the upcoming Flash movie that, really good. That's all I'm going to say. There's a scene with a dog that I think you're really going to enjoy. Anyway, guys, question is for you. What do you think about this? John Wick has now had its first film in its franchise cross the $400 million mark. It's the biggest of the franchise now. What do you attribute that to? Why do you think this thing has been able to have that kind of prolonged success? Do you think, as the major trades are speculating, that this might motivate Lionsgate to come back to the well again for John Wick 5? Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? We're going to be talking about Super Mario Brothers a little bit uh, here today, including, you know, the big story about its uh, triumph crossing the billion dollar mark. But there was an unfortunate another story that is out there that this weekend, the Super Mario Brothers and, you know, infringement and copyright and all that kind of stuff, that's a big deal to the Motion Picture Association. Well, the entirety, according to a report in Deadline, of the Super Mario Brothers movie got uploaded to Twitter. And not only was up on Twitter, but was there for hours. That accumulated, how many did it say it got? Oh, let me, 9 million views. 9 million people were able to watch it on Twitter, according to this report. That's more than Black Adam. <laughs> <laughs> it, Man. The Black, the Black, <laughs> you'll never get tired. It exceeded the Black Adam mark. Nine million people were able to watch it. And now, of course, uh, this all came about because uh, there's the new blue, blue checkmark system, right? If you pay, by the way, I lost mine. I mean. But some people have them still. It's a whole nightmare Yeah, it's, it's a weird thing. I but don't understand The it. big D-Day came and, yeah. and, and my blue checkmark got taken. It's okay. I've used, I think I put up a post about Joyride on Twitter the other day. It's the first, and I realized it's the first time I opened Twitter in about a month and a half. Oh, nice. So, but whatever. I need to delete it. But I, I, but I realized, oh, my blue check mark is done because you got to pay for it now. You got to pay for it. And if you pay for it, you are allowed to upload long videos yeah. up to 60 minutes. Oh. So they were oh. able to take the, the, uh, the Super Mario Brothers movie and put it up in two parts and stayed up for hours enough that 9 million people were able to watch it, according to the report. Now, this has caught the attention of the MPA for obvious reasons and the studios. And... Even in their breakdown, the reasons that this was able to happen was not just because people with their paid for blue check marks are able to upload videos up to an hour long, thus put up entire movies in like two, maybe three parts. But according to Deadline and some other outlets, the actual root cause for this being able to happen and why this is now becoming a big concern for the MPA actually goes back several months when, when Elon Musk took over Twitter. Because one of the first thing Elon Musk did when he took over Twitter, and by the way, I, I happen to be, I happen to count myself as a little bit of an Elon Musk fan. Yeah. I drive a couple of his cars. I love his cars. He's one of the first prominent voices in the world to really come out and address and talk about climate change and take it very seriously and trying to do things to change things about climate change. There are a lot of things I really like about Elon Musk. So let's just be clear. I'm no Elon Musk hater. But one of the first things that he did when he took over Twitter was he totally gutted their moderated their moderation system? Totally gutted it. Uh, this comes to us 
from uh, the report on Deadline said this, even before Twitter cut some 4,400 contract workers on November 12th, the platform was showing signs of strain. After Elon Musk bought the company and laid off 7,500 full-time employees, disinformation researchers and activists say that the team that took down toxic and fake content and any other content that required moderation, by the way, the team that would look after that vanished. Now... After years of developing relationships with these teams, researchers say that no one is responding to the reports of disinformation on the site, even as data suggests that Twitter is becoming an even more to toxic place. Basically speaking, the fail-safes that used to be in place and why places like the MPA, the Motion Picture Association, and others never really looked at Twitter as a potential danger spot was because they had a robust... They still needed more, but... Compared to a lot of social media platforms, Twitter had a robust moderation team that could monitor and address situations like this Super Mario Brothers situation very quickly should it arise. Now, it needs to be said in fairness that eventually the movie did get taken down, but again, not until it was already up for hours. Previously, it would have been up for a matter of minutes. It would have been up for a matter of minutes because they had a team, but they literally got rid of the team to look after this stuff. And so now with this happening, I was talking to somebody this morning that said the MPAA is now, is now taking a very serious hard look at Twitter and is thinking about flexing some legal muscles to say, you either implement, a, again, a robust moderation system in your, in your place there, or we might start looking at bringing, you know, some legal issues at you. Again, whether they do or not, who knows? We'll have to wait and see. I'm not sure. If that, I don't know if that's going to happen for a fact. But you know they got to be taking this seriously because this would not have happened before. And all of a sudden, Twitter, which was not a place that you consider as a prime breeding ground for content or copyright infringement, is now maybe becoming the, the premier place. Anyway, Chris, you saw this story. Uh, for, what do you think about it being on Twitter would you watch a movie on Twitter? I'm not sure I would, but it got 9 this million views. This sounds horrible to just be like... <laughs> What's your takeaway from this story? Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. You <laughs> fired a whole compliance team, bud. <laughs> this is going to happen. And this wasn't even the first time this happened. Over the weekend, too, the entirety of Avatar The Way of Water was up on Twitter. Oh, wow. So these things keep happening because, shocker, the people who are supposed to be looking out for this aren't there. So, I mean, obviously, I don't condone people doing this. I think that piracy is a huge issue. I don't think that you should just be streaming movies like this. That being said, if you don't have those checkpoints in place, things like this are going to happen and are going to continue to happen. So this account got suspended for copyright strike issues. Okay. They can make another account. Other people can do this, too. How are they going to stop this moving forward? They're going to have to hire a compliance team. Shouldn't have hired them, fired them in the first place. You know, it, you can bring up the argument. And I've heard this brought up already, and it's valid. It's that, well, come on, let's not pretend like Twitter's the only place that this is a problem. Well, of course. It's absolutely not. YouTube is far worse. The difference is, is that YouTube is a video platform, and it has it has been the place for it, and they're the ones who are trying to work on all kinds of stuff. The reason why this is a big deal is because Twitter was never looked at as one of those places. It was always kind of considered a little bit of a safer spot that you don't have to worry about a lot of, a lot at any rate, of copyright infringement going out there. And again, let's not pretend that this is new. Other people have uploaded stuff to Twitter before and all that kind of stuff. Yes, but it's now becoming a big issue for them. It's now going to become a big issue for, um, uh, for the MPA, for their member mm -hmm. studios. And here's hoping that, and again, we're not even talking about the social toxicness of Twitter. We're talking specifically about now copyright infringement, which was never a problem there before. No. So I don't know. Question is for you guys. What do you think is going to happen here? Apparently Mario Brothers was up there for hours, got 9 million views, something that probably couldn't have happened before, but given the circumstances now, it's not all that hard. What do you think should be done about it? Do you think anything should be done about it? Whatever you guys think, jump down into the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, Let's move on now to our Mint Mobile hotline question of the day. If you guys have a question for the show and would like to hear your voice on our show, go ahead and call our hotline number anytime 24-7 at 951-268-4259. And maybe, just maybe, you might hear your voice on our show. And today's question is asking, I mean, with Guardians of the Galaxy 3, 
Should James Gunn be considered the greatest comic book movie director of all time? Check it out. Hey, John and crew. Hey, John, how happy are you that the Maples won? That's not my question, but I'm from Tampa, so it's kind of a big deal here, too. But I just wanted to call and ask a question. Um, if you think that James Gunn is the best superhero director because of all of his movies have pretty much been bangers, I guess the Russo brothers are like close second in my opinion, but who do you think is the best superhero film director out of all of them? All right. Thanks a lot for calling that in, man. You know, it's funny because I was doing an Ask Me Anything yesterday and, and somebody on the Ask Me Anything asked me a very similar question to this. All right. So Guardians of the Galaxy 3 is coming out. James Gunn, of course, is now the head of DC Studios. He's going to be, and his first really kickoff of his DC happens in 2025 with Superman Legacy, which he wrote and is directing himself. And I also believe they've already cast their Superman. They're just not letting us know who it is yet. So with the upcoming success of Guardians 3 and how successful it'll be, who knows, we'll find out. Should James Gunn be in the conversation of the greatest comic book movie director of all time. Now, understand, when I say in the conversation, let me qualify that. In the conversation does not mean in the top 20. I think if you're talking about in the conversation of the greatest comic book movie director of all time, I think you got to limit that list to like three. So should James Gunn, understanding that my criteria of in the conversation means top two or three, should James Gunn be in that conversation or maybe even considered actually the greatest comic book movie director of all time? I have two thoughts on this. Now, before we go any further, look, you guys all know who watch my show. I am a self-professed, unashamedly big James Gunn fanboy. Uh, I don't like his movies because I like James Gunn. I like James Gunn because I like his movies. Uh, I think he's a terrific director. Um, I, I just love his approach to film and all that kind of stuff. So I'm a big fan. So let me give that preamble. Okay. So in the question of is James Gunn or should James Gunn be in the conversation of the greatest comic book director of all time, I have two trains of thought. On the one side, I think, yes, he should be in the conversation if for no other reason but the pure consistency of excellence that James Gunn has brought to the comic book genre. Now, this, these numbers may surprise you, but let's take a look at this. In James Gunn's history of working on comic book material, here's his rundown, and look at these results. Guardians of the Galaxy, number one, had a 92% critic rating and a 92% audience rating. Guardians of the Galaxy 2, 85% critic rating, 87% audience rating. The Peacemaker series, granted, a series, not a movie, but it's a film character and it's the superhero genre and it's in DC, so we're going to account it here, but that's why I put the asterisk there. But Peacemaker, a 94% critic rating and an 89% audience rating. His Suicide Squad movie, a 90% critic rating and an 82% audience rating. The Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special, a 93% critic rating and an 80% audience rating. And as of right now, Guardians of the Galaxy 3 is holding the lowest, lowest, lowest score that he's had <laughs> the lowest at 78. Lowest. Listen, when your lowest score is 78, you're doing okay. Good. 92, 85, 94, 90, 93, 78. That's just the freaking critic source, audience source. 92, 87, 89, 82, 80. This is the kind of consistency you want to see. These are the types of numbers to a director who is in the conversation of greatest comic book movie director of all time. You're going to be hard-pressed to finding many others who have that kind of a track record. Not many. Not many at all. Okay. So on the one hand, that's why I think, yeah, yeah, James Gunn should be in that conversation. Maybe he is the greatest comic book movie director of all time. However, I do have the opposite, another side of the coin. All right. There's a part of me that doesn't feel he should be in there. And here's why. It's, it sounds very simple. Maybe it's an oversimplification, but it's this. While Gunn has been consistently excellent, the reality is, for me personally, when I go down my personal list of the 10 greatest comic book movies of all time, not one of them is James Gunn's. I really love his movies. But in my personal top 10 list, none of them are James Gunn's. Now, you 
can talk about, you want to talk about the greatest basketball player of all time. You can have, for many reasons, LeBron James can be in that conversation. Because in multiple facets, he's in the top. He's the number one scorer of all time. I believe he's the number, Ray, maybe correct me if I'm wrong. I think he's the number four all-time assist person. And I think he's like number 11 or 14 all-time rebounds. I mean, it's, it's on every conceivable list, he's right up there. But with James Gunn and comic book movies, again, only my personal top 10 list of best comic book movies of all time, James Gunn doesn't have one. And, and that makes me ask, can you consider somebody the greatest of all time if they've never put in one of the films, if none of their films are in the top 10, it's like saying, can somebody be considered the greatest of all time if they never won a scoring championship? Can, can a player be considered the greatest of all time if they never won uh, won a title? You know, can any boxer be considered the greatest of all time if they never had a belt around their waist? And so in that regard, James Mangold, who did Logan, which I think is a top two or three best comic book movie ever made. I mean, James Mangold should be in the conversation before him. Obviously, Christopher Nolan with his Dark Knight films. The Russo brothers with Civil War, with Winter Soldier, with Infinity War, with Endgame. And, and I'm not saying all those movies are in my top 10 of all time. They're not. But, you know, Logan is. Dark Knight is. So I would say this, weighing those two things out, the angle of overall consistency, because again, bring that graphic up again here, Jonathan. The, the consistency, look at that. Look, I don't care whether you're a James Gunn lover or not, okay? I don't care. You got to pull your head out of your ass and say, okay, even if I don't personally like him because his movies aren't for me, which is totally fine, those are fucking impressive numbers. These are very impressive numbers. Like you have to acknowledge that. Even if it's, and it's cool to acknowledge that even if you don't like him. That's fine. But you at least have to tip your cap and say, that's a pretty damn good achievement, those numbers right there. A lot of directors and filmmakers would kill to have those kinds of stats. But for me personally, until Gunn makes a film that I would, I would personally consider to be in the top 10 of all time, comic book wise, I don't think Gunn is in the conversation for greatest of all time. Not yet. And maybe Superman legacy will change that. Maybe. Um, but until that happens, that's just my... Now, you may have different criteria. Anyway, Chris, let me go over to you here. There's a lot of angles you can look at this. Yeah. But if I were to straight up sit down with you and say, is James Gunn the greatest comic book movie director of all time or in that conversation, how would you see it? I would pop him in the conversation. Okay. I would put him in there because I do love the first Guardians and I really, really love the Christmas special. I think the Christmas special I love is magical. The Christmas special. I'm so excited to watch through everything before I see this on Thursday. I'm really, really pumped. But I mean, I also then, you have to do things on a case-by-case -case basis because, you know, Thor Ragnarok is one of my favorite comic book films. But then, you know, Love and Thunder really didn't do it for me. So Taika's somebody who I think would maybe be in that conversation, but then his next film he did didn't deliver for me personally, though it delivered for so many other people, right? Anytime we do these kinds of like top tier, best this, best that, it's so subjective that it's really hard to accumulate a list because really just depends on the actual content and story of what's delivered, right? Mm, yeah. You know, the story of Ego really didn't resonate with me that much. My husband loves that story because he really, really gravitates towards stories that are about, you know, like father figures and, you know, disappointment in family and choosing your own family and things like that. So the second one for him, he likes He's even gonna more love than the fast. first. Yeah. He's going to love He's Fast. He's going to love yeah. Fast and Furious. <laughs> <laughs> so those kinds of things really, really connect with him. So he definitely would think this is, you know, oh, of course, James Gunn is one of the top guys out there. But it really just comes down to your personal preference at the end of the day. Because for me, I'd, I'd look more towards, you know, the Russo brothers. Or maybe I I know not a lot of people like it, but I, I think Kenneth Branagh did some really great Thor stuff that I think is really, really fantastic and very comic book accurate for the type of Thor he was doing. I think Christopher Nolan would be in there, you know? Um, there's a whole bunch of other people that I would be talking about too, but it's so hard to say who the best is because their movies vary so much. Yeah. And of course, just like anything else, when we're talking about the art, it's going to be a subjective yeah, thing. Exactly. Absolutely. It is. But since you asked oh, and me, Del Toro. yeah, Del Toro. Thank you, chat. Uh, but since you asked me, uh, I, I would say as big of a James Gunn fan as I am. And as he has some of the most consistent numbers we've ever seen until for me personally, that he gets a movie in the top 10, I, I don't think he can be in my conversation personally. But the question is for you, most importantly, what do you think? 
Do you think James Gunn should be considered in the top, you know, top two or three, maybe the best comic book movie director of all time? What's your perspective on it? What's your line of reasoning? What kind of logic do you take to get to that conclusion? Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. Listen, we still got a number of things to talk about here today. Uh, the whole thing about Blade is getting a brand new writer just one month before shooting. Harrison Ford saying you're not going to see Indiana Jones on the big screen ever again. Mario Brothers having an incredible milestone past. But before we get to that stuff, we're going to take a quick second to thank a couple of sponsors of today's episode. Our friends at Honey and HelloFresh. Today's episode of The John Campy Show is brought to you by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. Guys, more and more, we enjoy shopping online, whether it's on our phones or our computers. And how many times have you gotten to the checkout and seen that promo code box and thought, man, if I only had a promo code, I could save some money. Well, thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. So here's the situation. You're shopping online on one of your favorite sites. And when you go to checkout, the Honey button appears and all you have to do is click apply coupons. Then just wait a few seconds as honey works its magic and searches for coupons it can find for that site that you're on and if honey finds working coupon just watch the price drop. Recently, Ann and I were hanging out at home one evening and we decided to order in and the honey button appeared. I was able to apply a coupon and I actually saved like six or seven bucks. It was that easy to use. And honey doesn't just work on your desktop computer. It also works on your iPhone. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. If you don't already have honey, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this show. Get honey for free at joinhoney.com slash Campia. That's joinhoney.com slash Campia. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's show, HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. And that's why it's America's number one meal kit. When the spring sunshine is calling your name, don't call for takeout. Get HelloFresh instead. Their quick and easy meals make feeding the family and yourself a cinch and without the high price tag. Their new fast and fresh options are ready in just 15 minutes or less. And guys, don't worry about it if you're not exactly a pro in the kitchen. HelloFresh's foolproof recipes arrive pre-portioned and easy to prepare in just a few steps. You guys know Ann and I have been using HelloFresh for a long time now, and we absolutely love it. Both of us being working professionals, it's often difficult for us to find time to make dinner together. But with HelloFresh, it's easy, it's fun, and it's absolutely delicious. So go to HelloFresh.com slash Campia16 and use the code Campia16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash Campia16 using the promo code for 16 free meals plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. And thank you to our friends at Honey and HelloFresh for sponsoring this episode of the John Campus Show. Remember, guys, when you go and check out our sponsors and support our sponsors, you're actually supporting us. So if you look down in the description of this video, you'll find links and promo codes to all of today's sponsors. And thank you again to Honey and HelloFresh. All right, guys, with that down, let's keep things going here. And we're going to get started off with this. You know, what? when was it? What year did they announce the Blade movie? I don't know. 1785? I was eight years old. No, uh, 2018? 2018, 2019, whatever. I can double check that. Many years ago, they brought out, Kevin Feige on stage brought out, the not one time, but how many times, Ray? Two times. Two times. Academy yeah. Award winner. The real deal. Mahershala Ali out on stage and announced that he was going to be Blade. And here we are in 2023, and they have not started making this movie. Oh, 2019. Uh, 2019. It was 2019. 2019. They brought him on stage and do that. So we're going on four years ago. We did have a global pandemic. There was a global pandemic. I'll However, there's also a lot of drama. Yeah. Uh, they swapped out writers. They swapped out directors. They put the whole damn thing. If you remember a while ago, they said, we're taking the whole thing off of the production line right now to try to reset <laughs> where we are. Mahershala Ali, stories came out that he was getting continuously frustrated with the script and all that kind of stuff. And then a little while ago, they got another new director and a new writer and everything looked peachy. They were on the road to getting this movie finally Fire. put together. Well, now... We got some Lucasfilm looking shit going on here. Wow. Because wow. according to reports. <laughs> Shout out, Lucasfilm. <laughs> <Luke Fu. laughs> 
delayed now <laughs> one month. One month before they're supposed to start shooting have brought in a new writer. A a and a good one. A good one. One that has worked with Mahershala Ali before. Uh, to come in and... Uh, working off the existing script and kind of rewrite a whole bunch of it. Uh, this comes to us from the Hollywood reporter said the following Nick Pazzolato has got, is going Marvel. The creator of acclaimed uh, crime anthology series, true detective is working on blade Marvel studios, vampire thriller starring Mahershala Ali. The development marks a true detective reunion as Ali starred in season three of uh, Pizzolatto's HBO show. Blade is batting its wings towards a late May start of production <laughs> Uh, in Atlanta with Yan Dimage, who helmed the pilot for HBO's boundary pushing horror series, Love for Half Country in the director's chair. Okay. That's all good. And that all sounds nice. If you're going to be bringing in another director, hell, the creator of true detective is not a bad way to go, but you start shooting uh, all the reports are saying this thing starts shooting near the end of May. That's less than a month away. And you're bringing in a writer now to start doing this thing? Now, now, according to the report, they're saying he's actually been working on it for maybe a couple weeks. Okay, that's great. So wow. like a month and a half before you start shooting. This is fine. <laughs> <laughs> this is fine. It's all good. <laughs> I Now you're bringing in a new writer? Look, and I don't want to pretend... Like it's it's a completely uncommon thing in Hollywood to have some to have a, a fresh set of eyes come in do a uh, do a fresher do a little bit of a punch up, you know Marvel used to do that. J Joss Whedon they would they would take a script bring in Joss Whedon, uh, fly him in and and be on set for a bit and write some punchier dialogue or whatever and it usually worked pretty well. But this is enough from what I understand, he's doing enough of a rewrite on the existing script. That by WGA standards, he's actually going to get writer's credit. That is not an insignificant amount of rewriting he's doing. One month before they're supposed to start shooting. Now, look, I don't know what happened to Marvel. <laughs> I don't know what happened because this, I don't know if this is a part of, well, no, uh, Victoria Alonso, she was, she was more physical production. She had nothing to do with creative. So I'm sure her departure has nothing to do with it. But I mean, it used to be a well-oiled machine over there. <laughs> I I don't know what's going on with this project. I mean, at this it does point. carry over from the Zaslav, like, and not Zaz, not Zaslav with uh, Bob Chapek. Chapek, yeah, yeah. So this could be ramifications about them maybe trying to just rush it through, push it through. Jen, can you look up how old is Mahershala Ali? I because I bel I think he's in his fifties. I could be mistaken about that, I, because I am because. I need to get a baseline for how old he is now because how old is he going to be when this thing comes out? He's 49 years old. Okay, so he's not 50 yet. Okay, granted, he's south of 50. So he'll probably be 51, 52 by the time this thing comes up because they're saying it's going to start shooting this month and it's going to come out in 2024. Which, by the way, is a very ambitious turnaround time for a tentpole kind of comic book blockbuster movie. Now, look, again, I don't want to run around and start yelling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. This is a tremendously gifted writer working with a tremendously gifted star in a tremendously high potential, <laughs> high ceiling property in Blade. Somewhere Morbius is grinning. Some <laughs> <laughs> it's the crossover everybody wanted. <laughs> So, I mean, I, I don't want, again, I'm not going to run around. I'm not I'm just saying here the sky's falling. All oh, blades are going to be a disaster. Uh, no, 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 no. But it is a little bit concerning because this type of stuff was not uncommon to see happening in the DC stables back when AT&T still owed them. This is not uncommon to see in Lucasfilm. No. But it is rare and uncommon to see it happening in something like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Anyway, Chris, you see this. Again, got to emphasize once again, the dude is super talented that they brought in. Mm -hmm. But it kind of, to me as an outsider, kind of looks like what's going on over there that you're bringing a new writer who's now doing enough rewrite that he's going to get WGA credit on this mm -hmm. thing. 
one month before you start shooting <laughs> this movie. Finish I don't know that what you script think. quickly, Pizzolatto. God, WGA <laughs> goes on strike tomorrow. Maybe you gotta you gotta get pen to paper, my friend. Go go go. Uh, I mean, <laughs> tremendously talented, tremendously talented. Created, uh, you know, True Detective. Before that, was working as a novelist and a short story author. Um, worked on uh, When They See Us. Is also penning the next Magnificent Seven film. Right. You know, really, really talented guy who obviously has had a successful collaboration here with Ali too. You know his turn on on True Detective Detective got him an Emmy nomination as well so incredibly talented guy I'm I'm coming from this with a little more grace um, because my background more so obviously as an actor has been commercials television episodics that sort of thing right and it is not unlikely for you to get brand new pages the day you step on set but that's also more so for television Film tends to be a little bit more tidy, a little bit more neatly wrapped, unless, you know, oh, hey, we were working the scene and this isn't working out. Let's really think about it. Let's really come back here. So, uh, well, while rewrites aren't completely odd, given all of the hoops this film is jumping through, it's just one other obstacle that doesn't make me feel great about it. (laughs) That being said, with somebody who is so talented and somebody who is known for, you know, darker, grittier storytelling, that's the kind of person who I do want on a Blade film because I do want this to be a little horrifying. I want this to be an uncomfortable oh, it's gonna be supernatural horrifying. film. <laughs> I want it to be horrifying in the right ways, not in the Morbius <laughs> ways. I don't want it to be Morbin time here. I want this to be a great, great film because I love Blade. The Tomb of Dracula is such a good comic. I don't care what anyone says. Every time we talk about the comics that are tied to Blade, people always talk about how there's not good source material. And there's great source material. Some of these stories are absolutely terrifying. And this is coming from a huge weenie like me. I want to be scared shitless watching this movie. So I really, really hope they get it together. I'm hoping this is a good sign of great things to come since they've had such successful collaborations in the past. I hope it's not another nail in the coffin. Uh, I see what you did there. Yeah. Uh, the coffin. The coffin. <laughs> nice. Uh, I, and again, look. And she's if, live, people. Oh my god. If again, I I don't want to make it sound like we're saying, oh, that this thing's doomed. Listen, like, if I had to put ten bucks on it, I would bet this movie's going to end up being really good. I I would I would put a small amount of money on that. But again, this is just the type of chaos <laughs> that I am accurate. not accustomed chaos. to seeing yeah. coming from Marvel. And maybe this is yet another sign. Listen, when Kevin Feige was running that that whole thing, and they were putting out like three, four projects a year. You never saw this stuff happen. And now you're putting out like 17 projects in two years, in a two year span. I I mean, I don't know. Anyway, guys, question is for you. What do you think about this? They have three and a half weeks uh, until they start shooting Blade, apparently. And they've got a new writer in who's redoing the script. Not from page one, not a page one rewrite, but still. And maybe he's going to have to stop writing tomorrow. uh, (laughs) With the strike coming up. I don't know, guys. What do you make of this whole thing? Whatever your thoughts are, jump down to the comment section below and leave your thoughts there. I'm so stressed out about the strike. About the right strike? So yeah. Stressed. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? You know, uh, seeing Guardians of the Galaxy 3, they didn't play your regular trailers in front of it because it was a special event screening, but they did play the all the upcoming Disney films. They played trailers for those. And so, of course, they did Elemental, which looks quite good, by the way. Uh, They did a number of them. But the trailer that got the biggest reaction from the audience, as it has been every time I've seen it in theater, is the Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny trailer. This movie's going to be pretty big. I don't know if it's going to join the Billion Dollar Club or not, but it's going to be big. And they showed us like a... How long was the sequence they showed us at CinemaCon? 20 minutes. 20 minutes? They showed us a 20-minute scene for at CinemaCon, that was the most Indiana Jones feeling stuff you could possibly imagine. It completely felt like Indiana Jones. Um, I thought it looked great, uh, excited about seeing it, all that kind of stuff. Well, we know that Harrison Ford has said that he is officially done playing Indiana Jones after this movie is done. However, now, in a report in Deadline, Harrison Ford is now also saying that he believes that this is going to be the last time we don't just see him as Indiana Jones, but it's going to be the last time we see Indiana Jones at all on the big screen. Uh, This comes to us from the folks at Deadline who write the following. Harrison Ford says that he believes the forthcoming Indiana Jones film, Dial of Destiny, will be the last ever time the celebrated archaeologist appears in a film. 
In an interview with Total Film, the 80-year-old star confirmed Disney's previous announcement that this will be Indy's last big screen outing. Ford said, This is the final film in the series, and this is the last time I'll play the character. I anticipate that it will be the last time he appears in a film. This will be the last time he appears in a film. All right. Let's talk about this for a second. Harrison Ford has gone above and beyond playing this character. He's made it one of the, I don't think it's an exaggeration or hyperbole to say maybe a top five most iconic characters in the history of Hollywood with Indiana Jones. Which means he probably has two of the top five in Indiana Jones and Han Solo. But he's played Indiana Jones for longer than a lot of people watching this show's been alive. Longer than maybe somebody in this room has been alive. I, I mean, he's been playing it that long. And the fact that it's time for him to hang up the whip, totally good. And I love that he's giving us one last swan song. But for Harrison Ford to come out and say, I anticipate this will be the last time you see him on film. Two things to point out. Number one, Harrison Ford doesn't get a say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not his decision about whether or not Her uh, Indiana Jones appears on the big screen again. So just there's that. I do not believe for one second that we will not see Indiana Jones, the character on the big screen again. Now, if Dial of Destiny comes out and makes Black Adam money, <laughs> then maybe, maybe it'll be a decade or two until we see them try to take a crack at Indiana Jones again. But we've known for some time in Hollywood the king high pinnacle of all things priorities is recognizable IP. IP, intellectual property, that's king. Franchise potential, that is king in Hollywood. The studios at CinemaCon this week talked about that, is that we need to cr keep creating original films because that's where franchises come from. <laughs> franchises come from original films. So we have to keep making our franchise movies, but we have to keep making originals to make franchise movies. But franchise is king. It's, it's just been proven over and over and over again. And I don't believe for one hot minute that if Dial of Destiny makes over $600 million, again, I'm not even saying a billion, this movie makes over $600 million, there is no chance, dare I say no chance in hell, hell. <laughs> that, I knew you knew that was coming, Yeah. <laughs> that the next CEO of Disney... And their board, and whoever, whether it's Alan Bergman still or another chair of Disney Pictures or whoever, isn't going to go, you know, the people seem to like Indiana Jones. We got them theme park rides at our parks. The last one made X amount of money. It's the most recognizable character maybe in all of fiction. I won 1,000% guarantee you there will be more Indiana Jones on screen. I I there I don't know that there would be many other things in the world of movies other than maybe Jamie Foxx coming back to play Electro that could shock me more than if like 20 years from now, we, we do a big John Campion show reunion 20 years from now, and we go, can you believe they still haven't made an Indiana Jones 6? I mean, I would be shocked. And it won't be Indiana Jones 6. It'll be a rebooted Indiana Jones. But I 100, 100, 100% guarantee you that while I completely believe that Harrison Ford believes there won't be another Indiana Jones on screen, on the big screen, I also 100% guarantee you he's incorrect. <laughs> there will be. You know why? Because in the words of Gordon Gecko, greed is good. <laughs> Greed works. In the world of movies, it is a law. They will make that money, and they will want to go to that well again. Anyway, Chris, you hear Harrison Ford. Uh, number one, where's your anticipation level like right now for, for Dial of Destiny? How well do you see it doing? But most importantly, what do you think about Harrison Ford's prediction here that we're never going to see Indiana Jones on screen again? I want that confidence. I want to think that when I'm dead, so are all my characters. None of you will take them ever. That's an amazing way to go through life. Good for you, Harrison. And honestly, <laughs> deserved. I love that. Uh, it's absolutely not going to happen, though. I mean, absolutely, they're going to bring her, uh, Indy back to the screen. They're absolutely going to do this. This is a huge, iconic character. He changed the way we view whips. He, he normalized did, yes. them. 
they're gonna have this character appear again. We've already had so many people talk about how they've been, you know, talking about this role or courting wanting to do this. And while Harrison Ford keeps insisting nobody can be Indiana Jones other than him, there will be another Indiana Jones at some point. Maybe not soon after this installment, but there will be some version of him. Right. I'm really excited about this film. I love James Mangold. I really, really adore him. I think that he is such a great director. That's a top tier, you know, comic book director that we've talked about. Top tier Western director. Come on. Yeah. Yuma. That's such a good film. And that footage we saw at CinemaCon was really, really fun. It was classic indie being indie, right? An epic car chase of sorts. You know, Phoebe Waller-Bridge seamlessly fitting into this kind of tapestry they've woven. I really enjoyed what we saw and I've got pretty high hopes for it. Where, how do you think this movie's going to do? Because, I mean, it's it's only, like, anecdotal at best, but, like, every time I've been in a theater, other than when the Mario trailer is played, because when the Mario trailer played, that always got the biggest pop. But yeah. in the absence of that, the, the audiences I've seen movies with, when an Indiana Jones trailer comes up and you hear those first music notes, bum, 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 like, that seems to be getting the best response. I don't know, what's your experience been and how well do you think this movie's going to do? I feel like when I've seen people react to the trailer, they get pretty excited about it as well. Um, I know <laughs> we had an issue when we were watching it here in the studio when it was just modern day music, quote unquote, right. as opposed to the uh, the actual score. But that's such a little note. I think it's going to do well. I think people want another good indie film. You know, the last one didn't really fire on all, all cylinders for most people. And I think people love this character. So I feel like it's going to get a lot of people that initial weekend. I really do think it's going to do well, but... We'll see. All right, guys. Question is for you. What do you think about this? Harrison Ford is saying that he thinks this is going to be the last time you don't just not see him anymore, but the last time we're going to see the character of Indiana Jones on a movie screen. I don't think he's correct in that. Maybe you do. Are you excited for the new movie? Maybe not. Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down... Let's move on to our final main topic here today, shall we? And that topic is this. You know, the Super Mario Brothers movie uh, has been, is it fair to say successful? A little. It's done pretty well. It's done pretty well. Shattering a number of opening weekend box office records, five-day weekend records, all that kind of stuff, and the tantamount success of its uh, as being an animated film and even not being an animated film. And it is now the highest grossing film of 2023 so far, but has done so with a type of power and momentum that has been simply undeniable. And now it has joined one of the rarest of clubs. It has joined the billion dollar club yes. as super Mario brothers movie. As of this moment is officially sitting at $1.022 billion dollars at the worldwide box office and it's still going and it's not still going like John Wick is still going make her three or four million dollars each weekend it's still rolling and it's still making money so how high will it go I, I could get up to the 1.2 maybe the 1.3 billion dollar range I mean it's making a load of cash right now which is absolutely phenomenal and I think has become the 54th Film and cinematic history to join the Billion Dollar Club. I, I might be off on my number there a little bit, but it's close. It's close to 54 uh, to join the Billion Dollar Club in the 100-year history of, of the movies that it's done that. And only the 11th animated film and cinematic history to join the Billion Dollar Club. That's crazy. But as of this moment, it is still not... Think about this. As successful as the Super Mario Brothers movie has been, it's still not in the top 10 highest grossing animated films of all time. It will be very soon, probably tomorrow. But as of this moment, it's still not in the top 10 of all time, although it will be. So wait a minute, you might think to yourself, with the success of, of this movie, I mean, how could there possibly be like 10 movies ahead of it? There are. So with the Super Mario Brothers right now being at $1.022 billion, there are still 10 films ahead of it, 10 animated films ahead of it. These are those 10 films. At number 10, will soon be knocked out of the, the top 10, but is Zootopia. Zootopia made $1.025 billion, which means that uh, 
Super Mario Brothers just needs me to go back and see it again tonight and it'll pass Zootopia. But the number 10 all time as of right now animated film is Zootopia. At number nine is Finding Dory, which made uh, $1.029 billion. At number eight, we have Despicable Me 3, which is actually the one movie in all of the Despicable Me and Minions kind of universe that I actually didn't like that much. But it made one point zero three four billion dollars and is the number eight all-time animated film in the number seven spot is toy story three um i still think my personal favorite of the toy story franchise uh in the conversation i think for the greatest animated film of all time to me but toy story three sits at the number seven spot with 1.067 billion dollars at number six is another toy story film toy story four that when they were making, when they announced it, everybody said, they don't need to make another Toy Story. Well, they did. And it made over a billion dollars. It is currently the number six all-time animated film at 1.073. Then we get into the top five. At number five, again in the Despicable Me universe, the first Minions movie with Sandra Bullock as Scarlet Overkill, one of the great villain names ever in animated films. Uh, Minions made $1.159 billion and currently sits at number five. In the number four spot is The Incredibles 2, which I didn't quite like as much as the first Incredibles, but damn, I did love it. I thought it was great. And that one made a whopping $1.243 billion. That's incredible at the number four spot. All right, now we're getting to the top three. The number three film is Frozen, uh, making $1.284 billion. And listen, to this day, when Ann and I... Uh, go out to a theme park. You know, I don't go to Disneyland anymore, but my wife does. But every time I would go to Disneyland, I, I would see minimum a dozen, minimum dozen sets of little girls there with their families dressed as the sisters, Bebop and Rocksteady. I don't know what the name of the sisters are. What are the name of their sisters? Elsa and Anna. What's yeah. that? Elsa and Anna. Elsa close. and Anna. Close. But really, yeah, so close. <laughs> also known as Bebop and Rocksteady. Yes. Nailed it. You walk around Disney, Disneyland, that's all you see is still. You want to talk about influential? That movie was super freaking influential. Well, what could top its $1.24, $1.284 billion? Nothing. Well, another Frozen film. <laughs> Frozen 2, which quite surpassed it by a lot made $1.453 billion. Again, I didn't think it was quite as good as number one um, as the first Frozen, but I, I really enjoyed Frozen 2 a lot. And they almost accomplished the impossible because that song in the first Frozen movie, Let It Go, um, like you can't possibly top that. They almost did it in Frozen 2. The, their main power song in 2 was... Um, Into the Unknown. Into the Unknown. It's a great song. Mm -hmm. It is a great, great, great tune. Anyway, that is the second biggest animated film of all time with 1.453, which leads us, of course, to the number one animated film of all time, the Lion King remake at $1.663 billion. Now, I see your mouth is agog and aghast. That's so surprising <laughs> to me. Um, how? How, <laughs> how did... What? The number one... And listen, I know I'm... I'm I'm in the minority. I love the remake. I do. Not as much as the original. Yeah. No, clearly not. But I really love the remake. I had a beautiful time at it. But the funny thing is, as I looked around online, looking at uh, other people's, like when I was looking up lists, a number of websites don't have Lion King at the top of the list because there is still to this day, this weird perception, I guess some people still call this Lion King remake the live action remake. Guys, there is nothing live action about this movie. It is an animated film. They used the real lions. <laughs> they, 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 they got the talking yeah, lions. Those very rare lions. talking lions. Mm. It is, other than, there's a little bit of trivia for you. There is one live action shot in the movie. And any of you guys behind the cameras know what that is? Um, yeah, of course, but we want to hear you say it. <laughs> <laughs> there is one and only one live action shot. And that is the very first shot of the movie, of the sunrise. I jokingly was going to say Were the Were you going to say that? That was it. That opening scene of 
Madurai. Like as the sun starts coming, that's it. That's the only live shot. Everything else in that movie is animated. Guys, it is not a live action film. It is a thoroughly 100% animated film. And it is the number one box office animated film of all time at $1.663 billion. Okay. So obviously with the number 10 one being Zootopia here, at uh, 1.025 billion. Obviously, uh, Mario Brothers is going to probably pass that by the end of the day. It's at 2.2? It is at 1.022. Okay. Uh, so probably by the end of the day, Mario's gonna bump out Zootopia right. and grow. So the question will become, how high on the list will it become? It'll obviously easily, with the blink of an eye, get in the number 10 spot. With Finding Dory being at 1.029 billion, I don't think it's going to have much problem getting that. Let's, let's go back to the graphic there. I don't think it's going to have much of a problem jumping the number nine spot. Uh, at 1.034, considering Minions or uh, uh, Mario's already at 022, I think it won't have any problem jumping the number eight spot. Also at 067, I don't think it's going to have terribly much trouble jumping the number seven spot. Same as number six. Uh, number five, Minions. This is where it starts to become interesting. But I think it's got more than $100 million still left in it. So I think it's going to climb the number five spot. Now, number four is where it starts. That This is where it starts to get a little bit in question. Mm -hmm. So I think the Mario Brothers movie is going to get into the top five. But can it pass The Incredibles $1.243 billion? That's another $220 million Mario needs to make. And it can. It can. But it, it, it's not a walk in the park. It's not going to be easy. So that's where it becomes iffy. So maybe Mario getting the number four spot is possibly on the table. And if if number four is on the table, then Frozen three at two point or a one point two four eight or eight four billion, that's also within reach. Because if we're gonna say, you know, point two four three is within reach, then point two eight four has got to also possibly be in reach. But I think that's where it ends. I don't see Mario getting to the number two spot with the 1.4, and I certainly don't see it getting the number one spot at 1.6. So if I had to guess, my guess is, I think it gets the number four spot. I think Mario will end up as, as the number four highest grossing animated film of all time. I think it can get that high, and I'm gonna guess it'll fall maybe just a hair short of Frozen 3, definitely show, short of Frozen 2. Anyway, Chris, we see these numbers. I mean, it's it's weird to think. I remember I first thought about that when I thought about, well, Mario's so successful, one of the highest grossing animated films of all time, and then realizing as of this moment, it wasn't even in the top 10. And you yeah. look at that list, and you realize how many billion dollar films there have been for animated. Mario's only the 11th to do it. Mm -hmm. What do you think about its accomplishment to hit that milestone? And how high up that all time list do you think it could climb? Oh, I think it can move a few spots forward. I'm still so confused about The Lion King. I'm genuinely, <laughs> I'm so confused because aside from you and Aaron, most people I talked to did not like that film. Did everyone just go all at once? They all went. And they all hated went it. and then were mad. Did they keep going back because they were still angry? I don't understand. <laughs> anyway, I I think though that this movie could do really really well. I think it could be a top ten contender for sure. You know, I I bring it up every time we talk about Mario. I live next to a theater and every single weekend it is kids dressed up as these characters going to see the movie and going to see it multiple times too. They'll let you know like, this is my third time seeing this. So I really think this has the potential to keep climbing because so many kids are so excited about it. I'm seeing it again probably this Wednesday. My building's doing a whole like resident appreciation night where we get to see a movie for free. and. It'll be my third viewing. This will be my husband's second. It's a fun time. I know the story's a little loosey-goosey, but I don't go see a Mario film for, you know, gritty, moving drama. I really <laughs> don't need that. I just wanted to see something that was reminiscent of my childhood and made me think about how much I love these games and everything. And I forgot about the voice acting, too, as I was watching it. So that was lovely. I think that this is going to be, you know, top eight, maybe. Could get in there. Well, I, yeah, I don't think eight is going to be a problem. No. I mean, eight, eight is, I, I mean, it could be top eight by next weekend. Yeah. I think a little past that is is maybe questionable. I don't know if we're getting those 1.4 numbers. No, that, I think, I, I think uh, Frozen 2 is probably safe. Yeah. Uh, getting back to the Lion King thing, though. You mentioned that other than me and Aaron, you don't really know anybody that liked it. Yeah. 
What's your over under on what the critic or what the audience score is for the remake of The Lion King? Ooh. I feel like it's probably somewhere around a 60. Okay. 88%. 88, really? The audience rating on Lion King, the remake, is 88%. Oh, well, I guess that just goes to show you that mostly when people don't like something, they're louder. Uh, we are. I yeah. mean, uh, we, we but also the critic rating was not great. The critic rating fell below the audience rating at mm -hmm. 52. So about, it's kind of split the audience. But um, yeah, so let's let's talk about this for a second. Why did Mario work? Because I'm going to tell you right now, this is not the greatest animated film of all time. <laughs> like by, by any stretch of the imagination. But it's, I want to suggest five reasons why I think Mario um, has worked and worked so well. Uh, the first one I think is this, and why it continues to be so success, successful. Nostalgia factor. I mean, that that is just a real thing. Nostalgia can be used as a cheap gimmick, but nostalgia is just a tool like any other tool. It can be used badly, but it can be used well. And I think in the case of Mario Brothers, the nostalgia factor, uh, the fact that we you know look at these things and we all remember playing these things, I mean, from our childhoods, up till last night when I jumped on my Nintendo Switch and played a little bit of Mario Kart because I had 10 minutes to kill. So there's a nostalgia factor. I think the second reason why the movie's done so well is because there are three generations of fans. Literally generations of fans. There are people going to the Mario Brothers movie who have been playing Mario games and their parents played Mario games and their grandparents played Mario games. And when you have that kind of legacy, multi-generational uh, stuff going on, that can be very, very powerful. I think the third reason Mario has been so successful is it had a fantastic marketing campaign. I mean, they knew how to touch on all the right stuff. I still remember when that one trailer came out where we saw Mario in the carts and on the rainbow bridge yep. and just seeing him go, woohoo, and stuff like that. Like all that stuff. They knew exactly the kind of movie they were making and they the marketing department on this, again, Full, full, full credit to their marketing department. They knew exactly how to push the buttons for those of us watching those trailers. They knew how, we already talked about nostalgia factor. They knew exactly how to use that short trailer and ping that, that nostalgia and get us excited and get us ramped up and into the theaters. And, and the marketing campaign was absolutely fabulous. Cannot underplay how big of a factor that is in the success of Mario Brothers. Also, the number four reason I think Mario has done so well is they played it relatively safe. There is nothing bold about this Mario Brothers movie. There is no new ground being tread. Um, there is nothing deep about this movie. And you know what? That's totally fair. They understood what the strength of this movie was going to be. The nostalgia factor, the multi-generational factor, the just pure, simple fun, right? And they decided they didn't have to do what some other animated films do, which is try to make it deeper, get into some more emotional stuff, whatever. They played it quite safe. And again, sometimes playing it safe is the right approach. And the Mario Brothers decided, they decided to play it safe and, and it worked. Also, this kind of goes around with the three generational factor, but I think it needs to get a, a category of its own as to why Mario did so well. It, it appeals to kids. I mean, it is bright. It's colorful. It's got a buoyancy to it, like this bouncy kind of whatever feel. It just looks charming and fun and delightful. So you got idiots like me who's like, I cannot wait to see Mario. But the kids wanted to go and rush and see this. This was a movie that was made for everybody, right? It's a movie that was made for everybody. And when you combine a great nostalgia factor with the fact that it has multi-generational appeal with an absolutely terrific marketing campaign, then you make sure not to alienate anybody, but don't, don't try to do anything special. Just keep it simple. And then on top of that, having a big wide appeal to kids, you had a big recipe for success. And it's really short. And it's short. <laughs> so like kids' attention spans, like they last through the movie. And plus you get more showings, I think. Whose attention spans? Kids. Mine. Yeah, and mine. <laughs> mine. That's right. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm speaking for us. <laughs> I speak for the kids, you know, so that's that's that probably works for them, too, because it does get more showings, right? Yes. I mean, with that 90, roughly 90 minute yeah. thing, you also got more showings, which normally doesn't matter unless you're packing out the theaters. This movie was packing out the theaters and was really able to leverage 
and use that additional, that those short run times to, to squeeze in that extra screening per day. So you put, and, and by the way, I want to just emphasize one more thing. This is another movie that proves that winning cures everything. Because remember when the first trailer dropped, all anybody wanted to talk about was Chris Pratt's voice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's going to ruin the movie. This is going to be awful. This is going to be... And guess what? <laughs> Winning cures everything. The movie came out. It was fun. It was enjoyable. <laughs> and well, but I, I don't hear anybody talking about Chris Pratt's voice anymore. Right. You know why? But guess what? If the movie was bad, Seth Rogen. <laughs> if the movie was bad, <laughs> yeah, now we're all talking about Seth Rogen as Dyke. <laughs> but if the movie was bad, mm -hmm. Chris Pratt could have done the exact same performance, exact same voice, exact same everything. Nobody's talking about it now. But if the movie ended up being bad and Chris Pratt was exactly the same in it, that's all anybody would be talking about. Well, they ruined it by having Chris Pratt do the voice. But winning cures everything. Now no one's talking about it. But yes, the Seth Rogen thing is hard to get. I love Seth Rogen. Might not have been the best choice to do him as Donkey Kong. Yeah. But eh, whatever. <laughs> anyway, guys, question is for you. What do you think about this? The Super Mario Brothers movie is now, as of this specific second, the 11th all-time highest grossing animated film and the 11th animated film all-time to cross the billion dollar mark. And it's going to jump a number of spots even just this week. How high do you think it can go? What do you attribute the movie's incredible success to? Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With all that down, we're now going to take just a brief second here before we move on and start taking your questions to hear from another sponsor of today's show, my mobile service provider, the good folks at Mint Mobile. We want to thank a sponsor of this video, Mint Mobile. From the gas pump to the grocery store, your utility bills and favorite streaming services, inflation is everywhere. Seriously, make it stop. Thankfully, there's one company out there that's giving you a much needed break. It's Mint Mobile. As the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, Mint Mobile lets you order from home and save a ton with phone plans starting at just $15 a month. You guys know that ever since I switched to Mint Mobile, I've been saving almost 70% a month over my my old phone plan. For people looking for extra savings this year, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just $15 a month. By going online only and eliminating the traditional cost of retail, Mint Mobile passes the significant savings on to you. All of their plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash campia. That's mintmobile.com slash campia. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia. And thank you to our friends at Mint Mobile for sponsoring this episode of the John Campia Show. All right, guys, with that down, let's now get to your questions. And once again, quick reminder, if you want to get a question on the show, you don't have to wait until the show is live. You can fire in a question anytime by going to our tip link, simply at streamelements.com slash John Campia slash tip. Fire it in any time. And uh, if it's appropriate to be used on our show, you'll probably hear it on this show or an immediately upcoming one. All right, guys, with that all down. Chris? What do we got in the live questions? Let's see. From Mud Awesome, how do TV age ratings work? The new series Citadel is filled with blood squibs, point blank bloody headshots, and a lot of F-bombs, yet it's rated TV 14. I'm not really sure. And the reality is it doesn't really matter. Like in, in the movie theaters, like if a, mo if a movie has an R rating, well, yeah, they won't let kids without an adult go in but on television it really doesn't matter so i'll be honest with you i'm not exactly sure what their criteria is and i've not watched citadel yet that's the one with um uh not john snow rob snow rob stark, rob stark. and uh priyanka who is mm -hmm. nick jonas's wife i have not heard good things about it though citadel. i have not heard good things about it but i i still want to check it out um, but I haven't seen it, so I can't really comment on why would this get an NC or a, a TV 14. But again, unlike movies, it doesn't really matter all that much. Yeah. If you go to motionpictures.org, they do have a whole breakdown of how they do the rating system for the United States. So but that's just for that movies, though, right? Or do they yeah. do it for television as well? I think it's well? also on there for television as well. But or you it? can go to filmratings.com, too. That's another one. All right. I might have to check that out. 
All right, good. some good direction being given by Chris there. All right, what's next? From Tron, what's your super early opening weekend predictions for Spider-Verse? In my opinion, 110 million opening. Agree? No. I would like it to make that much, very, very much. But the reality is that the first movie did not make all that much money. Uh, the opening weekend for Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse was, I believe, in the neighborhood of $35 million. I don't know if somebody wants to fact check me on mm. that. I think it was in the neighborhood of $35 million. Mm. So can it have a, a multiplier of four of an opening? What do we got? 35 there? million opening weekend. Uh, it was 35 million. Mm -hmm. There you go. $35 million opening weekend for Spider-Man and the Spider-Verse. Uh, can it crack a hundred million? I, I don't think it will, um, but it doesn't need to, right? I mean, I just think clearly this is going to have more success than the first one did because building off the incredible response to that first movie. But I, I think it'll be 100, 110. Will it double it at least? I, I can see 70, 70, 75 million. Yeah, I can see that. Listen, again, I would love to see it crack 100 million. I hope it does. And it's got a chance. But I, if I had to put money on it, I would guess... Yeah, somewhere between 70 and 80 million. And I think that would have to be considered a huge win. Huge win for them if they do. All right, what's next? From Tron again. What are your thoughts of Kid Cudi as an actor? I love his music, and he's actually a solid rapper turned actor. I'm excited to see him in Knuckles, and he's my dark horse for the DCU's Jon Stewart Green Lantern. Come on, James Gunn. What has he been in? He was in Need for Speed. I thought he was great in that. Well, you know, he actually, him and um, Paul, who's the kid from Breaking Bad? I want to uh, Aaron Paul. Aaron Paul. So, uh, Cuddy and Aaron Paul came into came into studio when when I, when we were at AMC and they sat down to talk about Need for Speed. Um, I again, my sample size of cut and Ann listens to his music yep. constantly. He, he had that hit at the end of Sonic Two too. Yeah, like that, she, that song was really good. She Ann listens to Cuddy all the time in, in our in the car. Um, but I don't have the big enough sample size to really say right. whether I think he's that good of an actor. I mean, he wasn't great in Need for Speed, but yeah. nobody was. He wrote and was in Intergalactic, that Netflix animated series. Right, that's, yeah, I remember um, that. And but, that's really a But really again, not thing. a good sample size of his acting chops. Yeah, so, I haven't seen his on-camera work. Mm. But Did you see how my uh, opinion is? <laughs> I said he was great in Need for Speed, and John goes, he wasn't great in Need for Speed. Thank you for I, correcting me. I, I don't know. that. It, that's just my opinion. I, I don't for, think anybody was for great in that. my first exposure to him, I thought he played that part really well, like the, the sidekick. He was, he was entertaining, but yeah, it wasn't a great, great role. But All right, what's next? From the sock. My favorite part of The Mandalorian Episode 8 was when Axe flew back onto the ship and said, Bo-Katan needs our help. He could have said, we've got to go down there or something. But to me, that line says he truly considers her his comrade. And the boss. I mean, that was, look, it was, it was a kind of a nice setup in Mandalorian where it's like, okay, I oppose you, but hey, you won. So you're the boss. And I, you know, that the Mandalorians have this honor code. And it was, I think there were better moments in Mandalorian season three, but that was a nice moment. I did like that one too. All right, what's next? From Willoughby Sting, I'm not a business owner, so I don't know how accurate this observation is, but I'm not sure why the studio presentations at CinemaCon would often discuss the creative side and behind-the-scenes details of their upcoming movies. That info caters more for news outlets and movie fans like us. But if I were a theater owner, how relevant would that be to me? I'd be there wanting studios to show me something that's worth devoting our resources to show, and we'll put butts in seats. Okay, so it's a good question, but let me explain why they would do something like that. The main reason they, the studios go to CinemaCon is to get the movie theater owners excited. Because you get the movie theater owners excited, you'll get better placement, you'll get more screens, you'll get you know, all that kind of stuff. But also keep in mind, the press is covering CinemaCon, right? So the primary priority is excite the movie theater owners. But secondarily, the press is there covering it. So you are talking to the general audience through the press. So that's there too. But I would also say this, even if it was just the movie theater owners, movie theater owners are human beings. They're people. So I know for me personally, I get personally more invested in and excited in a movie when I, when I can find an emotional attachment. When you got the stars out there talking about why this movie meant so much to them and maybe some behind the scenes story or talking about their process to anything that gets me more excited and built up, 
And you want to do that for the movie theater owners too. You hit it from a business point of view. This is what's coming. Here's the footage, blah, blah, blah. But now we're going to get you emotionally excited. And we're going to make you feel connected to our film. They brought out Vin Diesel on stage because he wanted, the studio and Vin Diesel wanted those movie theater owners to feel a personal connection to the movie mm. now, right? That's why they brought out Oprah Winfrey to talk about Color Purple. Because they wanted the audience not just to see the footage, they wanted the audience to get a personal connection to it now. You bring out Oprah to talk about the, the process of making and all that kind of stuff, you get them excited. You bring out Martin Scorsese because you want the audience, those theater owners, to get emotionally connected to it, to identify with it, to get excited about it. And, and that type of stuff, the behind the scenes, the processes, bringing out the individuals involved and all that kind of stuff, that's all a part of it. You cannot just reduce movie making and, and even business to just the numbers. You've got to get people personally involved in it and personally attached. And that's one of the reasons why they go all out, unless you're Disney, who completely fucked the bed. Um, that's why you go out if you're all out, at, if you're a studio at CinemaCon. Anyway, all right. Good question, though, man. All right, what's next? Uh, from Johnny Wiener. I just realized there have been four actors named Chris that have been getting cast for unusual roles that you wouldn't think of. Chris Evans is Buzz. Chris Pat Pratt is Mario. Chris Pine is Kig Magnifico in Wish. And Chris Hemsworth is Optimus Prime. For those of you who may have missed it, uh, one of the things they showed us, they showed us a, a full scene from the upcoming Disney animated film Wish in which Chris Pine, which we didn't get to hear from him, but Chris Pine is doing the voice of King Magnifico, which is a great char animated character name. I love that. So that's it. That's interesting. Um, the really weird one to me was finding out that Chris Hemsworth is going to do the voice of Optimus Prime. In young the upcoming, Optimus Prime. Younger yeah. Optimus yeah. Prime in the upcoming Transformers animated feature film, Transformers 1. So that was interesting. Um, and yeah, of course, the Chris Pratt is Mario. That raised some eyebrows. Chris Evans' buzz isn't a weird one. No. Just to think that any other name other than Tim Allen made it interesting, but that was kind of a standard one too. But yeah, anyway. All right, what's next? From Mod Awesome again. Have you ever seen the miniseries on Netflix called The Get Down? Yes. Baz Luhrmann is the showrunner and it stars Justice Smith, Shamik Moore, and Yahya Abdul-Mateen. I loved it so, was wondering what you think of it. Uh, Justice Smith, of course, from... Uh, the uh, Pokemon, Pokemon yep. the uh, Detective Pikachu, Dungeons and Dragons, Shamik, of course, from um, Spider Verse, from the mm -hmm. uh, he's he's Miles Morales in Spider Verse. I, I mean, yeah, you know what? I totally forgot that Boz Lerman was involved in that show. Yeah. Boz, Boz Lerman, Boz, who <laughs> loves to nobody loves talking about Boz Lerman as much as Boz Lerman. Yeah. I'm Boz Lerman, which I'll give him a pass on because I I love his I love his movies. I love his movies. I like Moulin Rouge is still a top twenty film all time for me. I loved his Elvis film. You know, I the guy's incredible, um, but yeah, it was it was it was great. But I totally forgot Bos Lerman was involved in that. Totally did. All right, what's next? From uh, now, Biff, <laughs> the Fast and Furious and Point Break both rip off the Charlie Sheen movie No Man's Land. The uh, Fast and the Furious more so because Sheen's movie is about cars and not bank robbers. Toodles. I I disagree. There are some similarities there, but I'm talking about if you looked sat down on a page sheet and you went and you just wrote out the plot turns, the plot points. Um, Fast and the Furious, there, there are some similarities with the Sheen film, but I mean, it is plot point for plot point. That first Fast and the Furious movie is like literally, they took an x-ray of Point Break and shook it and took all the bone skeletons and then just made the same movie, but with cars instead of surfing. That that's it. It's the exact same movie. Uh, and, and so I think that one is, is more egregious, if you will. All right, what's next? From BK Dan. Hey, John and crew. What do you all think of what Steven Spielberg was saying about after the fact, him changing the federal agents near the end instead of holding guns, the federal agents are now holding walkie-talkies at the kids and Spielberg regretting it. Oh, what do Talk we about think e. about the change in E.T.? Yeah, that would be the end of E.T. Don't care. No thought. I, it's a rather inconsequential thing. Director made this one little creative decision. It doesn't affect the movie or the scene one slightest ounce, whether the agents happen to be holding federal agent weapons or holding walkie talkies, it's irrelevant. Doesn't matter. Made no difference to the movie. And so unlike really Star care. Wars, like you can still get the original version mm -hmm. if you want. So, yep, very true. All right, what's next? From BK Dan. Hey John, not asking for a spoiler. Was the High Evolutionary a fully fleshed out character, or really just two dimensional? I like him fleshed out with backstories and such. Thanks, and always bring on the filthy, my film loving friends. 
The High Evolutionary was not a two-dimensional character, but he was also not fully fleshed out. <laughs> Most comic book movie villains aren't. Yeah. But what they so they did what they needed to do with the character. They introduced that he's a effing asshole. Um, and they introduced his motivation and a little bit of his background. Definitely not a two-dimensional character. Mm -hmm. But like villains in most comic book fil films, not exactly fully fleshed out either because you had so many other characters that are way more important to the movie than him. Star-Lord is way more important of a character to this franchise than the High Evolutionary is. Gamora is a way more important character. Um, Rocket is a far more important character. Drax is a far more important character. Nebula is a far more important character. Oh, you know who's really good How in this? How was Mantis? Movie? How was Mantis? Mantis, way more important of a character. Okay. Um, really nice conclusion for Mantis, too. I won't say what the conclusion is. It's really nice conclusion for Mantis. And by the way, Cosmo, who I've been wanting... I remember when I sat down with James Gunn to talk about his upcoming new Guardians of the Galaxy 1 movie... My very first question, I believe, to James was, just tell me if Cosmo's in the movie. And, of course, he said, well, I can't really tell you that right now. Uh, and Cosmo, of course, really, I mean, the dog pops up, but is not really a character. And then in the holiday special, Cosmo arrived. And Cosmo is in this movie and is a part of the Guardians of the Galaxy. I love the Cosmo character. And then it's high evolutionary. So you, you don't have time to give fully fleshed out journeys and whatever to nine different characters. So... It is not a two-dimensional character, but it's not fully fleshed out either. I mean, they, he can learn more about the high evolutionary, right, on our channel? Somewhere? Yeah, we happen to have. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> we happen to have an editorial video up right now. If you want to know more about the high evolutionary, we got an editorial video up right now. You can go check that out. Mm -hmm. All right, what's next? From TJ Perry. John, please watch the cutscene movies for Horizon Zero Dawn and its sequel, Horizon Forbidden West. The game will just piss you off, but story-wise, it is absolutely on par or better than The Last of Us. Hard to God believe. God of War and visually might be the best of the three. Please. I've 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 never heard anybody say it's better than The Last of Us or God of War, but I've I've heard from many people it's very good. It's beautiful. Yeah, I I am going to do sit down and watch those. I started downloading um Jedi Survivor. Oh, I thought you were downloading the Super Mario Brothers movie for, off, of, <laughs> off, of off of Twitter. Um <laughs> No, I bet you you'll get that ball rolling as soon as we start hearing more of about the movie because they're making a movie, right? Or for there, there were talks. I mean, I I don't supposedly? think it's been greenlit. Yeah, supposedly, yeah. I thought that was in the works already. No, no. Supposedly might be in development, too, but I don't believe it's gotten a green light yeah. or anything like that. So, well, okay. We'll PlayStation is definitely trying to mine more of their IP. Yeah, which right. makes they got sense. a whole dedicated studio to it mm -hmm. now. All right, what's next? From Mod Awesome, I believe the last time you were this happy by seeing two great comic book movies in a row was back in 2021 for The Suicide Squad, followed by Shang-Chi. Am I right? Uh, yeah, I'd say that's probably a good call. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's probably a good call because I love both those movies, man. That's a long time, too. Yeah, that's, that's it's a couple of years. It's, especially but, the, uh, the amount that have, has come out. That's yeah, a long time. There's been a lot of content since then, and that, that might be the last time I, I enjoyed to this level. Back-to-back -back movies. Suicide Squad was magnificent. Shang-Chi was magnificent. So, yeah, that, that's that's a good call. All right, what's next? From Jesse Has a Turtle. You've mentioned before that you when you, le uh, you leave when fans will come and approach you in person, but have you ever had an instance where maybe someone was too invasive or something? Or maybe just even being too creepy online? Um, yeah, of course that happens. It happens. Fortunately, it's the minority of the time. And also, fortunately, even in the rare occasion that it does happen, it's well-intentioned, mm -hmm. you know, like I, I, I've never had somebody being overly intrusive or maybe borderline, even a little bit creepy where you can tell that their intentions were nefarious, right? It's, it's always meaning well. And so because of that, it never really bothers me too awful much, but yeah, yeah, for certainly it does. Happen. It is the minority of the time though, but it happens. All right. What's yeah. next? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It doesn't happen much. Mm. So. Yeah. No, even for women, it doesn't happen for them Get out either. of here, Jonathan. It doesn't happen. Ben Jansen <laughs> saw Guardians 3 and loved it. A perfect mix of heart, comedy, and action, and a satisfying conclusion to the trilogy. Mm. It's my favorite MCU since Endgame. The scene set to No Sleep Till Brooklyn was one of the best action sequences I've seen in an MCU film. Hey, listen, there's some very good action in the movie. And that's that's a good scene. Actually, that was Anne's favorite scene, um, was the scene set to that song. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's my favorite since Endgame. I mean, to me, that's still Shang-Chi. I still think Shang-Chi is the best movie they've done uh, since Endgame. Um, I'll be in the minority. I think Shang-Chi is a better movie than Endgame. But Endgame is not 
and a movie in and of itself, Endgame is a, a, a crescendo conclusion to a 20 plus part story. At any rate, uh, yeah, I'm glad you liked the film. I enjoyed it very, very much too. All right, what's next? From James Locke, Ben, one of two. Aloha, John. Hope you're having a great weekend. Or week. I Had loved, one. <laughs> I loved the CinemaCon coverage, and I was so happy to see Anne finally going as well. I can't wait to see The Flash. I was disappointed that Disney didn't bring their A-game. Do you think they're saving it for some other showcase later? I would think that CinemaCon would be the most important showcase because it's for theater owners, and theater theaters are where a lot of their bread and butter comes from. Thoughts? Now listen, I was very, very clear on, my, on our CinemaCon coverage. Disney shit the bed. Mm -hmm. They totally shit the bed. Compared to the other, like every other studio ran, ran laps around them. And they did, every studio did a much better job. Um, now, that's not to say there wasn't some highlights in the Disney presentation. The Indiana Jones footage was great. I enjoyed getting a look at Elemental. Actually, uh, the Elemental thing to Elemental me was, was really good. I mean, yeah. that, that got me really invested in that movie. Um, you know, the Wish song that they played, the scene, that was nice. Um, but it's just, when you looked at how much effort and how truly immersive and how just enjoyable every other studio did theirs. I remember I was talking to Ray because Ray at first thought that maybe I was being too hard on Disney yeah, for a what a shit job they did with their presentation. Until who was the next studio after this? Was, yeah. was it Paramount? Was that next? It was no, no, no. The, it was another big one. It was, uh, was, was it Universal? Was Universal. Universal. Yeah. Yeah. So then the next presentation the next day was Universal, and Universal banger job, banger job with their my, my favorite. Yeah. Out of the whole and Ray comes up to me and goes, "Go, all right. I wasn't with you talking about how bad Disney did until I saw Universal's presentation. <laughs> but now then, I get it. But then I also remembered how they went. They they did their presentation last year, and I was like, compared to last year, yeah, wow, yeah. it's almost like they just quit the whole industry. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was just like in and out. Like the thing you brought up with the Elemental, I'm having like flashbacks now because we did see 30 minutes of Lightyear last year, and then what yeah. that turned out to be." They showed us the best 30 minutes of light. Yeah, yeah. We saw, we saw the Let's first 30 minutes. Uh -oh. We saw the first 30 minutes of light year, and I thought this is going to be the the fourth animated film in history to be nominated for Best Picture of the Academy Awards. And then I went to go see the full movie, and the first 30 glorious minutes played. I'm like, oh, isn't this great? This is so good. And then it just kind of went yeah. downhill after that. But let's hope better for Elemental. Yeah. Let's hope like that does that's not like a streak that they start going on. I have a feeling we did not nearly see the best of Elemental. I, I have a feeling, I mean, I just, I, I like the direction they're going with Elemental. I, I think it looks really interesting. Anyway. Yeah. I, I like how the characters are so opposite from each other. I, from what we saw, I couldn't even see the, the two actually getting together. That's, I want to see how they get there. Well, it's, what I'm it's, saying. A, it's a Capulets and Montagues? Montagues. Montagues and the Capulets uh, sort of situation. All right, what's next? From James Lockman, one of four. Aloha, John. Because I have a very hard time sleeping and take tons of sleep aid throughout the night, in the past I was able to send super chats at 12 a.m., 2 a.m., 4 a.m. <laughs> and then at some point it stopped, and I'm sure you explained on an episode of why you did away with it, but I must have missed that episode. I'm sure it was to probably streamline things and make things easier and run smoother. I've been watching your show for many years now, but I could never watch your show live because I was always... At work. And in order to send in super chats, I'd have to be watching live. Ah. So the only thing I could do was to submit ideas or to be a part of the main topics of the shows. And to my surprise, you've chosen a number of them. But I want to apologize for all the other ones I sent that maybe were too dumb. <laughs> I'm glad you brought uh, brought it uh, brought it tip link? Brought yeah, in tip link. Brought in the tip link. So, okay, so here's what happened. We, back when we used to, we still use super chats on the channel, but we usually use those now for open mics and ask me anything. What we used to do was the event, the live event for the YouTube channel would go up like the night before, right? So like today's show, the live event would be posted last night and then we would just start it this morning. And because the live event would be up the night before and it's there, people could go into the live chat, start putting in super chats, all that kind of stuff, right? The problem is um, the show couldn't be ready the night before. I mean, we, we, we did it that way for a while, but the show was always unprepared mm -hmm. and we were finding quite often, like you guys understand the, the one graphic that Ray probably spends the most time working on is the main thumb, <laughs> right? Just... 
That's the one, the, the like the main episode thumb, like the one behind me. That's the one that Ray will spend the most time on. And what was happening quite often is that we would post the live event the night before. And then as the news cycle would start in the morning, we'd have to swap out the main the main thing. And all of a sudden, that all that work that Ray did to make the main thing is gone. Not only that, but some, we started running into the thing where we would get more off the tops than actual main topics. Yeah. And oh, yeah. so it's just... It would probably just be easier and less stressful to do it yeah. that, the, the day of. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't like having to be at my desk and writing at 6 o'clock in the yeah, morning. Yeah. I don't like it. Plus, there's a writer's strike. Yeah, plus, there's a writer's <laughs> strike. Fortunately, I'm not a part of the WGA. Mm -hmm. uh, let, me, let me rephrase. I fucking hate having to be already sitting at my desk and typing at 6 o'clock in the morning. I hate it. But, as Ray pointed out, it just turned out that, like, the show we would put together the night before wouldn't even really look a lot like what the, the yeah, actual yeah. show ended up being because of all the stories that would come out, we'd have to change the main topic. It's like Blade. <laughs> like, <laughs> like Blade, so like many Blade. changes. And so it just became not practical to do it that way. Um, now, I do. we do start putting things together the night before. Mm -hmm. I have a routine, end, end of every day, I'm, I'm sitting out, I've got a little fire pit mm -hmm. in the backyard. I go out, bring a drink out with me, bring my either my laptop or my iPad with me, I sit there and I just work on the next day show for a few hours. But again, because all the, a lot of the stories start coming out the next day, we can't post the live event to the next day. And that's why eventually it stopped that you could start sending in super chats that far early. So that's, and now we use, we use the tip link instead uh, because it makes it available. So people can send in questions anytime, 24 seven. And from our perspective, and you see the tip link again, right there, streamelons.com slash John came slash ship from our perspective, it's also more advantageous for us because not only can people send in questions anytime 24 seven, but YouTube keeps one third of whatever the super chat you send in. So if you send in a $9 super chat, YouTube keeps $3 of it. Whereas in our tip link, I think they keep 5%. Yeah. So if you send us $9, we, we get $8 and 50 cents of it. Right. So it's, mm -hmm. It's it's so it was much better for us. It was much better for our user experience, and that's why we stopped putting up the uh, thing the night before. I love the early morning picking out stories. When I would do Friday shows or Weekly Hero, it was like my favorite part of the morning because I wake up so freaking early already. Oh, no. I'm up at four, so I'd be like emailing all of them, being like, "I found a couple stories while I was on the treadmill this morning." Um, right, but you want to know what part is not so fun? Mm -hmm. So go to my screen here. So it's not just finding the stories. But then finding the email that goes with it? <laughs> uh, no, it's not. Or are we? Do we not? Do we not have that? Yeah, it will. It just I gotta load. Okay, so it, so it's not so much picking out the stories. That's not the thing. Mm -hmm. It's the picking out the stories, and then having to create everything that goes with the stories. Right. So mm -hmm. we yeah. get the story. Now the research starts. Mm -hmm. Now I start going in and going to the history of the story. And then, you know, if there's, if there's things to, to point out or things to pluck out and information to be gleaned, then getting those, that information together, putting it together in an information list to give yeah. more value to our viewers. So our viewers are getting more information and context. And uh, it's uh, yeah, the picking yeah. out the stories isn't the hard part. Yeah. It's the, all the stuff that goes into it. Once you got the stories picked up. Oh, for out. sure. Right. You're a night person though. I'm a morning person. Mm. I'm asleep by nine. <laughs> And then I wake up at four and then I'm full of energy and I want to do all of that stuff at like 5 a.m. Yeah, yeah I, I don't like picky. being up at six to do that. <laughs> all right. Morning, noon and night sleep. Let's keep going. What's next? <laughs> From BK Dan. Okay, John, over under 25%, Black Adam ends up making more than the Dave Filoni Star Wars movie. Assuming it does happen. Thanks and bring on the filthy. Always. Um, no, like, you know, it's funny because the Dave Filoni... Um, th this came up on, on the thing the other day. Somebody asked if I think the Dave Filoni... No, here's the question somebody asked. Somebody asked, out of the three new Star Wars movies that they announced at uh, Star Wars Celebration, the Rey Skywalker one, the... Um, uh, why am I freezing on the Logan director's name all of a sudden? I was just talking about him. James Mangold? J yeah, James, the James Mangold Star Wars movie or the Dave Filoni one. Which one has the highest possibility and chance of being a billion-dollar film? And I said, the one with the least possibility of hitting a billion dollars is the Dave Filoni one. Not because it's Dave Filoni, not at all, uh, but rather because that's the one movie that's getting made that's just the continuation of a couple of TV series that people are accustomed to watching for free and a TV, a series of TV shows that are losing their popularity. Um, 
I mean, after Mandalorian season one, I mean, Mandalorian was super, super hot. Mandalorian season two, a lot of people were grumbling and complaining about season two until the final episode when Luke Skywalker showed up. And then all of a sudden everybody was on board with it. I was on board with it all of season two. And I'd have people <laughs> yelling at me, you're just a Disney shill for liking Mandalorian season two. No, I liked every episode of Mandalorian season two. But, but anyway... And then this season, out, <laughs> then you had Obi-Wan, which was subpar. You had Book of Boba Fett, uh, which which crapped the bed. And Mandalorian season three, which I think most people would agree was the least good of the Mandalorian franchise. And at one point they say through the, the season had 25% less viewers than season two did. Now, apparently the finale had pretty had, had a pretty strong viewership. I think the, the final episode had a pretty good, pretty good uh, rally there. But overall the viewership for the season was down, significantly down. So does now taking that and making it into a movie, is that movie going to make a billion dollars? It's not impossible, but I I, I have serious, serious doubts. I mean, if, if they put the armor in the jetpack again, I mean, that might make a billion dollars, at least for me. Yeah, I, people can uh, just watch it like on TV for free. Did you like that scene? Of course I did. The, the, the jetpack little... Uh, the aerial battle at the end of the season was yeah, fantastic. She, she didn't even have a blaster. It was just like her, her little web thing. Oh, her hammer. Bonging everybody. Her Mjolnir. Yep. Yeah, her that little Mandalorian so Mjolnir. She liked that. Yeah, listen, there are a couple episodes of Mandalorian season three I really liked, but it, it was a drop in quality. So it has nothing to do with Dave Filoni. The question is, is a movie based on these TV shows going to be a billion dollars in the theaters? And, and I don't think it will. Maybe you disagree and maybe I'm wrong. I hope I am. I hope it's great. All right, what's next? From Brandon, like you, I loved the first season of Severance, and I've been really excited about season two. Mm -hmm. However, there was a recent report from Puck News about the behind-the-scenes drama, and wow, it's an absolute shit show. Really sad to hear this, honestly. I haven't heard anything about it. Nope. I haven't heard anything about it. So, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I Listen, Severance was a show that, I got to admit, the first episode didn't really do it for me, but I decided to stick it out because I love Adam Scott, and I fell in love with the show. The show's great. I cannot wait to watch season two, but I haven't read about any of the behind-the-scenes drama, to be honest with you, so I can't really comment on it. Has if, if, any of you guys heard about any of this? No. 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 I, what's Puck News? Yeah. Oh, it's a news. It's an industry newsletter. Oh, Are okay. they credible? Yeah, yeah, they're pretty good. Okay. You know, the thing with Severance was that's the first show I ever watched where I felt just felt like talking to people about it the next day after. Oh, yeah. Because there was like so much mystery behind it. I've never had that experience with the show. I usually I usually shut my mouth because I don't know anything. But... Unless for all mankind, you talk. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. But that, <laughs> but that one is more like, what do you th what do you think? Who do you think this is? Or what what do you think is happening here? Yeah. It's... All right. What's next? From Anonymous, should the MCU bring writers, directors like Rami for Doctor Strange 3, Loved Horror in 2, one is most templated MCU to me, Shane Black, Joss Whedon, J.J. Abrams, they can do humor action, they can take notes to write the script, they have style, and what are they doing now? No, look, it's, it's X actor and X role, X director and X movie, they just need to get good storytellers. I mean, that's it. And it doesn't have to be these popular, famous people. Um... I think the real problem that Disney has had, Marvel has had, I should say, it starts more foundational with, with poor scripts. I, I think they've had poor stories for the most part. There have been exceptions. Again, Shang-Chi was fabulous. Um, man, not much else besides that. I mean, WandaVision was fabulous. Ms. Marvel was fabulous. Um, but I, I think fundamentally, and, and you know, there are some that I didn't love but weren't bad. The fundamental problem was I just don't think their stories have been compelling. You know, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania did not have a compelling story. Uh, Thor Love and Thunder, they had a lot of the foundational stuff there, but it, it just didn't have a compelling story. I love all the Thor and Jane background stuff in that movie. I really did. I love that stuff. But overall, it just didn't have it. So it's really kind of more foundational to that. And I think more of that has to do with the fact that Kevin Feige has been able to be less hands-on because of the sheer volume of content they've been trying to do. So it's it's really more foundational than that. So no, I don't think that the key to it is just getting these famous directors. The, the key to it, I think, is starting a more of a, a foundational level of just making sure you have better stories to tell to start with. All right, what's next? From Jojo Giraffe, just saw air, wow. It's this great. movie hit me at the right time and in the right way. I work on talent brand deals and there were so many things that felt uh, uh, analogous 
to what I've gone through. Analogous. Analogous, thank you. Uh, To what I've gone through. Loved it for more than just that, but it made it that much more special. Nice. First day reading. (laughs) I honestly, and I mean this is high praise, I put this movie on par with The Social Network. Um, I, I just, I love these stories about real things that happened with things we don't give a lot of thought about. How did Facebook come to be? How did this shoe come into being? And the story behind it. These human real stories have a way of doing it. And Ben Affleck just showed again, he is truly one of the best directors in the game. Uh, what he was able to do with the performances, with the characters, it's a wonderful movie if you have not checked out Air. And according to the box office, not many of you have. Uh, if you have not checked out Air, make sure you check it out. I think Same with gonna... Pinball. Come on. <laughs> Better than Pinball. <laughs> All right. What's next? From Anonymous, I saw the first three episodes of the new HBO series Love and Death. It's about the real-life murder of Betty Gore by Candy Montgomery. This show is great, and Lizzie Olsen is brilliant as Candy. Rest of the cast is great, too. Have any of you seen it? No, but I've read some scripts because my friends were auditioning for it. Ooh. And, ooh, ooh, those scripts are really, really good. So I'm very excited about this one. I've added it to my queue. I saw one trailer once for it. Mm. So I really don't know much about it, and I haven't checked. I didn't even know it debuted yet. Mm -hmm. But I'll listen, Elizabeth Olsen, I'll check it out. What's it on? HBO. HBO? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you'll probably have to watch it in my house. Oh, yeah, I'll probably have to steal. <laughs> like, it'll probably right, have it's to on, be 3 a.m. viewing. <laughs> All right, what's next? <laughs> From Storm and Norman. I understand you're not a huge Fast and Furious fan, but from a diehard fan of all the films, I'm telling you now, Hobbs showing up at the end of Fast X would not in any way be bigger than Brian O'Connor showing up. I didn't expect it until part two, really. Um. So... We were, by the way, I am a Fast and the Furious fan. I just I thought too. nine was garbage. <laughs> like that's <laughs> well, then but you I, clearly you're not a fast fan. So I, I love like five, little... love six, love seven. Really liked and eight. Y'all know I'm a diehard Fast and <laughs> Furious fan. Hobbs and Shaw. All from Hobbs and Shaw. Hobbs and Shaw, baby. So it came up on one of the live streams this weekend that about you know because Michelle Rodriguez made a comment that. She just watched the movie for the first time and she goes, I could not believe what we did at the ending. It's going to make everybody go, ah, what happens at the ending, right? Mm -hmm. So we were speculating a little bit on the show about what this ending could be. I mean, they've already gone to space. And I suggested that one thing that would really get a huge pop like that, and it ain't going to happen, but is if that somehow at the end, it's like Dom says, you know, the family just isn't big enough to deal with a challenge like this. And here, hold on to your, you know, but sugar puss and, and rock comes Dang, walking in. Dang, that would be so good. Is that you what know? he calls him? And I have no context for this film. Sugar, yeah, sugar puss. puss. I mean, that's, oh, that's okay. something The Rock has said a number of times. That's I don't know if he sweet. ever said in The Fast and Furious. And with all the drama and all the everything that's gone on and Dwayne The Rock Johnson walks in or Hobbs watch in, that would be huge. Brian, Arco- Here's the thing about Brian, though. They've already done it. They've already done it. They've already had him still on screen. They brought him back. They had his... You know his his brothers do stand in and and I mean not in a not in a really significant way, but they've done it. So to have like one of Paul Walker's brothers walk in with some CGI to make him look more like Paul, I mean that would be big. That would be big. But they've already kind of done it once. So that's why I think that if The Rock showed up, given all the drama that's happened between Vin Diesel and Dwayne Johnson, which by the way is why it will never happen. But if it did, theoretically oh. speaking. I think that would that would uh, give a pretty big pop. Like this whole time, their whole thing was a work. I would be I would be impressed to be honest. I'd be very. That would be a long work, and everyone believed it to the point where reporters were. That'd be the best acting, and it was outside yeah, of the franchise. Yeah, and that would be that, so. That would crazy. be the that would be the best acting that Tyrese has ever done in his <laughs> career. <laughs> oh he's wow! I mean, your door again. <laughs> that oh, would be wow. pure pure. Emmy worthy acting, like pure, pure award winning Ty- acting. Tyrese is about to come to the next yeah, he's gonna, con. He's going to be knocking at John's door again. Yeah. Well, I'm saying theoretically, if it was all work, it'd be some incredible acting. Oh, That's yeah, what I'm yeah, saying. I got, you. I got you, baby boy. I'm not shitting on his acting. I'm saying if he you, did, that was boy. a fake. It truly would be Fellini esque, like Emily Blunt was saying. Yeah, Fellini. <laughs> all right, what's next? From Mojito Fan, I bought a cheap microphone which had good reviews of $30 for a hobby podcast I'm experimenting with. As a first timer, I didn't want to spend too much, but people have told me I should have gotten a better one. Are they correct? Is Audacity okay for editing? Audacity's uh, great for editing. Audacity's perfectly. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if you want to spend a little bit of money, I do prefer Audition mm-hmm. uh, and whatever, but Audacity is perfectly great. Perfectly great. Yeah. Um, you can get some very good $30 microphones. Mm-hmm. Um, if you wanted to. Now, I can't comment about whether you should have spent more or not because I can't hear your mic. 
Yeah, yeah. that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Does it sound bad or not? Exactly. Yeah, I listen. The reality here's the thing: the reality is these days you will have a very hard time buying a bad phone. Phones are so good now. Yeah. That you would have a very, very challenging time. I mean, I'm sure you can do it, but you would have a hard time literally buying a bad phone because phones are almost all phones today are great. So obviously some better than others, but, and the thing is that's microphones, including USB mics have gotten to the point now that they're, they're pretty good. Yeah. Um, not and to, not to mention OBS covers a multitude of sins. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, even the, the filters and the whatever, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I'm sure your mic is fine, I, but again, I, I can't directly comment on it because I don't know, number one, what make or model of the mic you bought was, and I haven't heard it, but most microphones today will do pretty well for you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I for a show like mine, I, I make my living doing this. So yes, I, I have a $200 mic, mm -hmm. uh, sure, but... Uh, yeah, honestly, did, you're probably fine. Did he say he was doing a hobby podcast? Yeah, yeah. Hobby, I'm hobby. very interested to know what the hobby is and a, a good luck. Well, to I you. think the podcast itself is the hobby. Oh, that's what that's okay. what I think. He I means. thought it was yeah. a specific hobby, like remote control cars. It's about pinball like collecting. It's about oh, pinball. Oh, about not watching that movie. Nobody did. <laughs> yeah. Nobody when did. Ready, when you're ready to nope. invest in another mic, though, you can always buy them refurbished from Reverb or from Sweetwater. Um, right now, also, too, the Does audio... Sweetwater do refurbished yeah, ones? Yeah, you can get refurbished oh, I, I stuff like there, Sweetwater, too. Yeah. Um, uh, the Audio-Technica AT2020 Plus USB mic used to be $125. Right now, it's being sold on Amazon for $57. That's a great starter mic. That's actually usually what I travel with. But honestly, what you want to spend most of your money on, too, is the space in which you're recording. Yeah. Because if you are recording at a big cavernous space that has an echo no mic is going to do well there you could have a 900 dollars mic and it's going to sound shitty because of the space you're in so think about investing in padding your space too using moving blankets things like that is a great way to start or if you have a walk-in closet yes with full of clothes i used to record like the movie news feed in yep. my walk-in closet yeah. it, it sounded like i was at abbey road it was oh, great yeah that was how i used to record too before i got my booth all right guys and that'll do it for today's installment of the John Campy Show. Thank you so much for being here, making this show part of your day. Big special thank you to all you guys who sent in those tip questions. Number one, because you give us great fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported this channel as you did it. And all of us involved here at the show, thank you guys so much for your support. Also, want to remind you guys one more time that if you live in the LA area, anywhere around here at all, and you'd like to come to uh, our Special live event that's coming on this Saturday, this Sunday, I should say, in Burbank, California at the Flappers Comedy Club at 5 p.m. in the afternoon. You can go down to the description of this video and you'll find live in-person tickets. You can get that. And if you don't live in the L.A. area and you'd like to get a virtual pass to watch the live stream, that is available down in the tip in the uh, uh, description of the video below as well. Got kind of mixed up there. Anyway, guys, <laughs> make sure you come back and join us again tomorrow for the next installment of the John Campia Show. Thanks so much for being here. For everybody in the room, my name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.